All right, well, good morning, good evening, good afternoon to everyone, um, depending on where you might be in the world. Welcome to this session on strategies to address global health inequities. My name is Nalini Anand, and I direct the Center for Global Health Studies at the Fogarty International Center at the US National Institutes of Health. My NIH colleagues, Dr. Vidya Vedham at the National Cancer Institute, and Dr. Monica Webb Hooper at the National Institute on Minority Health and Health Disparities, and I are delighted to host this session and are honored to be joined by a really stellar panel who will, uh, who will challenge all of us over the next few hours to think and to act boldly to promote equity in how research is conducted with the goal of better health outcomes for all people. Before I introduce our first speaker, just a bit of background on the genesis of the session. I'll also give you a brief roadmap of the session so that you have a sense of what's coming and can begin to formulate your questions um, for the live Q&A that we'll have at the end. Although some of our panelists will address definitional issues in the context of their presentations, I wanted to articulate a common understanding of what we mean by health equity and health disparities at the outset. So health equity is the pursuit and attainment of the highest level of health for all people. Health inequities are preventable inequalities in health between populations. And we think of health disparities as the differences in the incidence, prevalence, mortality, and burden of disease among populations due to existing differences in social, economic, environmental, and other social determinants of health. We're at a critical juncture in global health research where stakeholders are engaging in more dialogue, and there's increasing awareness about health disparities in the US and in low and middle income countries. In addition, longstanding inequities regarding how global health research is supported and conducted and in how results are disseminated are increasingly under scrutiny. So we must harness this momentum to learn from each other across disciplines and perspectives to not only recognize these problems, but also identify actionable steps that can be taken to address them. And importantly, our speakers then are not only gonna articulate historical and current inequities, but each of them sets forth constructive solutions and concrete ways in which we can work towards eliminating disparities and inequities in research. So just to give you a very quick snapshot of just some of the key points that our speakers will raise, I, I'm not trying to steal their thunder, but I do want to give you this teaser um, so that hopefully you can stay for the whole thing. You don't want to miss any of it. Uh, Dr. Lisa Adams is going to address equitable partnerships and, and the need to change ingrained paradigms and how research partnerships are designed and implemented. She'll also tackle what we actually mean when we say decolonize global health. Dr. Joya Mukherjee will emphasize the need for harnessing social science frameworks in addressing preparedness, resilience, and health disparities. And she'll also address the importance of learning from communities and strategies to better engage communities in understanding the root causes of disparities and development of interventions. Dr. Agnes Benaguajo, We'll discuss funders' responsibilities in advancing global health equity, including more support of holistic and interdisciplinary approaches, a keen focus on in-country priorities, more attention to long-term outcomes, and building robust accountability structures into research funding. She'll be followed by Dr. Mauricio Maza, who will use a cervical cancer screening intervention to illustrate how the conduct of research can decrease disparities in access to care and uptake of interventions among the most marginalized populations. And then we'll end the presentations with two speakers from NIH. First, Dr. Monica Webb Hooper will highlight the historical disproportionate focus on biological vulnerability and mechanisms in health disparities research and really provide an exciting vision moving forward that focuses on more holistic population level determinants and interventions, utilizing health equity lens. I would note here that although NIMHD is focused primarily on health disparities in the US, the principles that Dr. Webb Hooper is gonna articulate are broadly applicable across diverse contexts, including LMICs. 
And of course, there is much that the US can learn from LMIC, how LMICs have addressed disparities in their countries. Finally, Dr. Satish Gopal will speak about cancer inequities from a research and treatment perspective, including the dearth of research on cancers that most affect those in LMICs, as well as the lack of oncology trials in those settings. And then we'll end with a live Q&A session. So please be thinking of questions you might wanna ask the panelists. We do hope that most of you will be able to stay and benefit from hearing all of the speakers. Now, if you do have questions in the meantime, please feel free to put them in the Q&A, in the chat box, I'm sorry. And hopefully the speakers can address some of those questions and comments as we go. So with that, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Lisa Adams. Dr. Adams is the Associate Dean for Global Health, Director of Global Initiatives, and a Professor of Medicine in the Section of Infectious Disease and International Health at Dartmouth's Geisel School of Medicine. She oversees Dartmouth College's Global Health Initiative at the John Sloan Dickey Center for International Understanding and is the Director of the Geisel Center for Global Health Equity. Dr. Adams. Good day. My name is Lisa Adams. I'm the Associate Dean for Global Health and Director of our Center for Health Equity at Dartmouth Geisel School of Medicine. And I'm going to be presenting on equitable partnerships. Is this what it takes to address global health disparities? And before I begin, I just want to thank the organizers of the satellite session and the UGH for having me present today. So I want to talk about our global health partnerships. And I imagine that many or maybe all of us have engaged in global health partnerships. I mean, this is what we do, right? So why do we need to talk about them now? Well, I'm here to challenge the way that we have been conducting our global health work. If we look closely and honestly at our global health partnerships, we may see that they are not necessarily as balanced or as equitable as we might hope or like them to be. And equity is particularly important when partnerships are forged across a great resource or income divide. When institutions in high income countries partner with those in low income countries. So if those of us from high income countries and well funded organizations or institutions choose to ignore or pretend that this resource divide doesn't matter or affect how we are perceived or received, we risk unknowingly replicating the very inequities we seek to mitigate. And I will venture to state that the stakes are higher than we might think. Getting these partnerships wrong can have grave consequences. Many of us certainly have heard of partnerships that ended poorly or were put in jeopardy by bad behavior. Or more commonly, perhaps, many of us can recount failed efforts in which an assessment was made about what a high income country partner identified to be a critical gap and with maybe some tacit agreement or polite acceptance from maybe the incorrect set of stakeholders, that high income country partner just plowed ahead as type A personalities tend to do with a solution to a problem that was not really a problem or a priority for the population they were working with. And this was met with a big fat failure. And these failures come at a cost. And these costs are in the forms of eroded trust, squandered resources, and continued disempowerment. And frankly, it is time that we stopped learning this lesson on the backs of these communities. So if we want to have no more of these preventable failures, and if awareness of these complex issues is the first step, how do we avoid replicating the very damaging patterns and inequities we are striving to eliminate? I propose that it will take a paradigm shift in global health, a fundamental change in our approach and our underlying assumptions. And I'm gonna propose four major paradigm shifts to get us started. So paradigm shift number one, we need to move global health out of the realm of charity and 
into the realm of global citizenship, into national and health security, into a framework of human rights and social justice. We need to recognize that it's about equitable partnership and interdisciplinary collaboration. And we need to recognize global health as a rigorous academic discipline. I have said that you wouldn't want someone who dabbled in surgery taking out your appendix, so why would you want someone who sort of dabbled or did global health on the side engaging in these, what I think are high stakes, partnerships and collaborations, right? So we need to stop thinking about global health engagement as sort of a feel-good opportunity for someone from a high-income country. We need to take it out of that realm of volunteering and part-time volunteerism. And again, we need to partner with organizations like CUGH to work with our academic peers to make sure that there is the rigor and that global health is considered the academic discipline that it really should be. Paradigm shift number two. We need to dismantle this global versus local divide. This is really an artificial distinction. As one of my smart colleagues actually at a CUGH conference some years ago now once said, our global is always someone else's local. Now, when we talk about training in global health for students from our high income institutions, what we find though many times is that these global settings are actually more appealing. So if I ask a student, would you like to go work with this family pictured here on the left um, in some unnamed low income country to, to work on their um, health needs or concerns? The students often um, respond with great enthusiasm. Yes, I would love to do that work. And they ask why and they say, well, I feel like I could, you know, uh, really make a difference there. I feel like I would have something to contribute. I feel like I could have real impact. Yet, if I show a picture of a family that might be living domestically in rural Appalachia, or, um, uh, in, in rural New Hampshire, maybe only an hour or two away from, from where Dartmouth is, and ask a student if they would like to go work to help the health needs of this family, uh, they might be a little more hesitant and they say, well, I'm not so sure. And you ask why and they say, well, that's a lot more complicated scenario. There's um, deeply entrenched issues and challenges and I I'm not sure I could be very effective in that setting. And what can you say? What is the difference between their response between working in these two settings? Well, again, I will put forth that I think the difference is about understanding the context. I can assure you that the challenges, the health challenges, the social determinants of health that are affecting the family pictured on the left are just as deeply entrenched and just as complex as those for the family pictured on the right. And yet, what it is is that our students have a deeper understanding of the context of one setting. So again, we really need to make sure that we strive to understand the context, the historical legacies of the places where we work. And that is true whether they are across an ocean or across town. So paradigm shift number three, it's not about pins on the map. And I say this as someone who um, supports and helps direct a number of um, student programs for global engagement, but it's really not about having lots of superficial engagement um, in many different places. I say it's about having really deep and meaningful um, partnerships. I say it's about bringing our learners to the world and the world to our learners. And very importantly, it's about practicing reciprocity. And I can say that that has been one of the most revealing aspects of, of our global health um, programs. So if we are going to send a medical student from Dartmouth, Nareth Carlisle, to, for clinical training, to participate in a clinical elective on the wards of Muhibili National Hospital in Dar es Salaam, Tanzania, 
we need to be willing to accept and support Good Luck Liatu and Jacob Kagizi from um, Muhambili University to come do a clinical elective, to have clinical training at our Dartmouth-Hitchcock Medical Center. And I can tell you, once you do that, it changes everything. So when the first year our Tanzanian students arrived and my colleague said to me, gosh, they said, this is really hard. These students arrive, they're very enthusiastic, they're very well-intentioned, but they don't know our healthcare delivery system, they don't know our electronic medical record, they don't know where the lab is, they don't know how we get things done. We have to orient them to just about everything. And I had to smile because these are the same people who might have said, oh, that's great that you're sending our students over to um, a hospital in, in Dar es Salaam, Tanzania. That's so noble. That's so courageous of them. They're going to go there. They're going to have an incredible experience. They're going to be so helpful when they get there without at all realizing that our students arrived from Dartmouth at Muhambili um, Hospital in exactly the same situation that they need to learn how healthcare, the healthcare delivery system works, how the medical record systems are organized, where the lab is, how they conduct um, healthcare delivery in that country. They need to be oriented to everything as well. And we would had been sending our students overseas without really acknowledging or recognizing the burden that we were placing on our Tanzanian um, hosts and our Tanzanian collaborators. And, and, um, and medical educators. So practicing reciprocity, reciprocity has been one of the most powerful tools for us to understand how to construct effective um, uh, global health programs. And again, it is a key element. We cannot um, engage, I think, in this work without practicing reciprocity. So paradigm shift number four is I sort of have to remind us uh, whether we're coming from a high income country, from a, um, a well-funded um, domestic NGO, um, wherever we're coming from, if we're coming um, with, uh, with resources, it's not about us. It's about placing the partnership at the center of the work that we do. It's about following our partner's lead and it's about making sure that their priorities set the agenda always. And I'm tr very careful even in the language that I use here because when I presented on this topic before, I, in the past I would say, well, we let our partners lead. We let their priorities set the agenda. But you hear the difference there, right? And I have to ask, who are we to let? <laughs> This is not about one partner letting the other do something. This is really about following our partner's lead, about having their priorities set the agenda. So again, just very subtle changes um, in our language, though, so important if we're going to really be um, uh, talking the talk and walking the walk of making sure that there's equity in our partnerships. So I would say that really what this all comes down to is an overall paradigm shift in global health engagement that we're talking about. And that is one of decolonizing global health. Right? We are, need to be constantly asking who's driving the activities that we're engaged in. If we are going to decolonize global health, we really need to be um, changing the way that we act, changing the, the words that we use. We need to be um, changing up everything that we do in this work. And really, as I said, um, putting our partnerships under, that, that, under the microscope and giving them that critical uh, review and honest appraisal. So I I'm reminded of uh, my colleague, Dr. David Bainsford, whom I met when he was leading global health programs at, um, at Harvard's Mass General Hospital, because his, he told me a story about how students would come to him and say how they wanted to go work with him. They wanted to um, engage in his programs which, uh, around HIV care and prevention in, in Uganda. And he would ask them again, 
why do you want to go? What do you want to do? When you get there and they would say, oh, I want to go. I want to have an impact. I want to, I want to um, make a difference. I want to engage in this research. I want to contribute. And he would pause and he would say, tell you what, we'll make plans for you to engage in this project and find a way for, for you to, um, to uh, spend a month or two or three in Uganda with our partners there if you promise me one thing that you will try to do no good. And they would sort of look at him and say, what do you mean, do no good? <laughs> and he would say, that is so important and explained it this way. As soon as I told them that they were, that they really needed to try not to accomplish anything when they were there, it, it completely had them reset how they approached this experience if they thought they had to go in there and accomplish something and do some good, they would go in there like a bull in a china shop, elbowing their way to the front of the line with their own agendas, making sure that they accomplished what they set out to accomplish uh, before they arrived. And he said, I really wanted them to reset and move, shift into learner mode, shift into listening mode. And that's how he got it, by telling them first, do no good, don't try to accomplish anything when you're there. Um, and I thought that was a good, a good lesson and a, and a um, provocative way of, of um, getting our, our students and learners to, to rethink about how they, they um, conduct themselves when they're overseas in, in uh, global health engagement. So we really need to spend some time thinking, how do we co-design projects? How do we co-problem solve? What does that really even look like? And really, again, be starting from the very beginning to, to rethink how we um, engage in these partnerships. How do we work together across borders, across history, across the power dynamics that exist in our society today? And so again, just causing that um, reset is so important. We need to be very careful and pay attention to our language, to our behaviors, to the way we, we conduct ourselves, um, the way we behave, and we need to, do, need to do a whole lot more listening than talking. We need to do our research uh, before we, we engage with our partners. We need to understand uh, their current context, and we need to understand their historical, and particularly colonial legacies of the places where we work. Um, so important to, to uh, being able to bring um, equity to the partnerships that, that we engage in. So I'm sharing this picture from 2012 because I had the privilege of um, being one of the first physicians to arrive in Kigali, Rwanda to help launch uh, the Human Resources for Health program. And I'm going to share some, um, some stories and wisdom from my co-panelist um, and, and one of my global health heroes, Dr. Agnes Benigwahu. Because at the time, she was the Minister of Health. And from the outset, she helped make it clear that this was a Rwandan-led program. Okay? program focused on rebuilding, strengthening the Rwandan health education system, and a program led by Rwandans. So when we would ask questions like, gosh, this is a great um, you know, teaching hospital, there's, there's uh, so much active learning happening, could we bring our US students here to train? And she would say, well, how is that going to help our Rwandan medical students if you do that? When we talked about, gosh, there's so many unanswered questions, um, so many complicated cases that we're seeing here, could we initiate some research projects? And her response would be, well, as long as you provide Rwandans the research authority, the data ownership, publication co-authorship, and by the way, make sure that you publish in open access journals so that we can download uh, our own research. I mean, it was just, wonderful how she really um, had us rethink everything that we did from the Rwandan um, perspective and ensured that 
all of our solutions were Rwandan driven and Rwandan owned. Um, and I have said to you in, um, in uh, many different contexts that that program, uh, our Rwandan partners are really offering us a new paradigm, but that it shouldn't be incumbent upon them to do, uh, to do so alone that we as their colleagues and collaborators also need to be thinking about how we foster equity in our partnerships. We need to be thinking about how do we construct collaborative research programs? How do we not just have co-PIs on paper, but really in practice? We need to be thinking about how do we build our equitable partnerships so that we are quite literally uh, working and operating shoulder to shoulder um, as, as uh, equal partners in, in uh, these partnerships. And we need to continue to practice reciprocity. Again, I really do think that's one of the uh, secret sauces uh, to uh, uh, equitable global health engagement. It's reciprocity that ensures the benefits are equalized across the partnerships. So I really feel that that has to be a key part of all of our uh, global health work. And again, it's really about building human capital. That's, I think, should be our, our um, end goal and long-term goal. And to do that takes time, but we really should be in this for the long haul. We ought to be focusing on the next generation who will not have to ship, shift the paradigm, but will be used to functioning naturally in this new paradigm that is based on equity. So I'm gonna conclude with this otherwise unattributed African proverb that guides our work. So if you want to go fast, you go alone. And if you wanna go far, you go together. And I assure you, we ought to be in this for the long haul. So I will end there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Adams. Wonderful and engaging talk to start us off. How we design partnerships will be absolutely paramount to making progress, so, so very much appreciated. Next, I'd like to welcome Dr. Joya Mukherjee. Since 2000, Dr. Mukherjee has served as the Chief Medical Officer of Partners in Health, where she coordinates and supports PIH's efforts to provide high quality comprehensive, comprehensive health care to the poorest and most vulnerable. She's an associate professor at the Division of Global Health Equity at the Brigham and Women's Hospital and in the Department of Global Health and Social Medicine at Harvard Medical School. Dr. Mukherjee is also on the faculty at the University of Global Health Equity in Rwanda. Dr. Mukherjee. Hi, thank you for having me on this panel. My name is Joya Mukherjee. I am the Chief Medical Officer of Partners in Health, and I'm also an Associate Professor at the Brigham and Women's Hospital and Harvard Medical School. And I'll be talking about health equity and the U.S. response to COVID today. Um, I'm going to start with the framework that probably many of you are familiar with. It's the Global Health Security Index. It was published by Hopkins, the Economist Intelligence Unit, and the Nuclear Threat Institute in late 2019, and it looked at factors um, like the financial uh, analysis of countries, the status of health systems, and ranked all um, of the countries in the world on this scale based on these factors. And there are six main elements to this index. The prevention, which is really the emergence of pathogens, um, detection and reporting, rapid response to mitigate the spread, health systems, the strength of those, uh, the compliance of a country with global norms, and the risk environment, um, the overall vulnerability. And so in this index, um, the United States was ranked at the top. You can see the big American flag up there. Um, and other countries uh, that I'm gonna be talking about, like Belgium, is kind of middle of the pack, the United States at the top, and here's Rwanda. And I'm not gonna scoop Dr. Agnes Beneguajo too much. I'm not gonna talk too much about Rwanda, but just a bit. Um, and you can see that over the uh, first 30 days, which of course is so critical to respond to COVID, um, the state of Georgia, home of the 
once and hopefully again venerated CDC uh, had 4,400 cases. Uh, Belgium had 7,400 cases. And Rwanda in the first month only had 134 cases. Now, many people think that's because of not enough testing. That is simply not true. High levels of testing, very low percent positivity rate. So, you know, in my role as Chief Medical Officer of Partners in Health, I'm often just, uh, you know, I was at the time just um, working with our sites all around the world to make sure that people had PPE, test kits, um, and all oxygen and the things that uh, we need to respond to COVID, understanding that it was a terrible threat. But within a month, it was obvious that the epicenter of this would be in the United States. And even though I'm American, uh, I was a little surprised, um, even though I know my country fairly well. I'm also a practitioner of social medicine, so I wanted to understand more um, as we were asked increasingly to work in the United States and to help mitigate the spread of COVID. Um, I wanted to understand a bit more about what was going on. And of course, I think we all know when we think about who is harmed, uh, it is largely black and brown people, people living in congregate settings, people in prisons, uh, nursing homes. Um, you know, on the lower right hand corner of my slide, my right, uh, probably your left, is um, a parking lot in Las Vegas where homeless people were given um, boxes uh, on the ground to sleep. So this is really, you know, where we are in the United States. And um, I think it's really important to understand that. Um, the essential workers we talk so much about, uh, more than half are black, indigenous, and other people of color. Um, in the agriculture, industrial, commercial sectors, and many of them do not have health insurance, do not have unemployment benefits. Uh, many are undocumented. Uh, nearly 70% of essential workers don't have a college degree, and 70% of that workforce is women. So how do we understand the disparities in COVID in the United States? And does it matter? Maybe it doesn't matter, but of course, that's why we're here, we think it does. So again, as a practitioner of social medicine, I started to think, what are the basic social theories that we can use to really understand what's happening in the United States? And how might those theories and also our experiences around the world help us craft this? So I looked to two very brilliant uh, African scholars on colonialism, uh, seeing that this was really a problem along the color line and because of racism in the United States. And um, I read a lot of Ashil Mbebe, who is um, a Cameroonian scholar, and he talks about necropolitics, and especially in the era of Trump. Um, and I was on the Lancet Commission of Policy and Health in the era of Trump, which if you haven't read, it's pretty interesting. But this necropolitics was very central to Trump's uh, uh, leadership. And so when you have a group of people for whom you actually, it's more convenient for you if, uh, if they die, if they're erased, uh, that's what Mbebe calls necropolitics. And I think it's very important when we think about what our response will look like. The second is the famous Franz Fanon, post-colonial scholar from Martinique who uh, lived in Algeria. Um, and he talked about this compartmentalized oppression uh, and that that is really necessary necessary condition for racial domination and of course we see that in the United States which is so terribly segregated and then I also uh, intersected that social theories with uh, black feminism which really is about um, frameworks of mutuality and care uh, from the great bill bell hooks and the whole notion of intersectionality uh, from Kimberly Crenshaw, Patricia Hill Collins. And then lastly, the idea that the opposition, uh, the marginal, the people who are the most affected ought to be central to the conversation. And you know, for us at Partners in Health, this is really a lot of how we do our work, um, is centering the knowledge of the affected. Uh, for more than 30 years, we have led uh, with centering the voice of patients as community health workers, fully 11,000 of our 17,000 uh, person staff around the world are poor people. 
um, are community health workers, and 99% of them are from the communities uh, that they serve. So I was an engineer once upon a time, and I think of social medicine like an engineering diagram where you have forces that uh, have a magnitude and a strength, and they also have a direction, and that our job in social medicine is to push against those forces because we know that the social determinants of health, and in this case, we're talking about racism, patriarchy, um, and uh, the things that really put people at risk, um, that that is how you practice social medicine. So if you think of COVID in the middle of this teeter-totter seesaw, you think of the things that the social forces that can give us control, and you think of the social forces that plunge us into chaos. And I think if you think of the biology, in fact, it's not that different, obviously, in one person from another. There's some host issues, of course, but the biology of COVID is the same in Rwanda as it is in Belgium, right? The biology of COVID with you know, the exception of the current variants uh, is the same everywhere. But what's different are the social and political forces. And that's what I'm gonna talk about a little bit. So how do you counter those forces? Um, to, to us at Partners in Health, it's building mutuality and trust uh, through working with community and then leadership that is based on this mutuality and trust and decolonizing knowledge. Um, and I'm going to talk about that as well. We call all of those things uh, in a bundle. We call them accompaniment. Um, so I'll just talk about things we've learned in other pandemics. Uh, working with community health workers as I have my whole life, um, they have been just exceptional, knowledgeable, important people in our movement to treat HIV. Um, people living with AIDS themselves have been central to giving others their medicine, their encouragement, food, water, and that longitudinal support, uh, which one could describe it solidarity, but it really is a force of nature that pushes up against the chaos and privation of people's lives. And we don't have anything like that in the United States. We have in pockets, and we have wonderful community uh, health workers in the United States, but there's few and far between. Um, one of my favorite uh, mentors in medical school, a pediatrician named Paul, Paul Kui, he told me he cried um, when they told him he couldn't do home visits anymore because he couldn't imagine, he's a much older person, and he couldn't imagine being a pediatrician without seeing where children live. And I think we've divorced ourselves from this social reality um, and so overly favored the biomedical model. This is what I've learned. Um, you know, I, I was trained at the Mass General and it's all about what you know and what you have in your back pocket. And I think so many of us in global health start to say, okay, I'm the expert and I'm gonna teach a, you know, a, a community health worker about malnutrition. But what I've learned from people like Ura Charles uh, on the left, uh, the community health worker who's giving out the pills, is that I actually am the one that needs to be taught. And I think decolonizing knowledge is as important. Representation is critical, but we also have to decolonize knowledge. And so one tip I will give you uh, in, in my work and how we work at Partners in Health is through Frarian pedagogy. And so I'll give you an example of that. So if I was going to teach about malnutrition, rather than standing up and having a PowerPoint and having an audience, I would sit down at a table with community health workers, draw a line on the chalkboard or a whiteboard, and, and ask one question. This is a field. How do you feed your family? And what you see then is a huge amount of knowledge and mastery that people share. Well, we prepare the field and plant the seeds. When, when do you do that? Well, before the rain, do you own your land? Do you not? What do you have? I have chickens. Do you use them for meat? Do you use it for eggs? And you start to learn so much about what people have mastery over. And that's how you decolonize knowledge. And then I say, okay, this is what I'm looking for, you know, to try to help you when kids have, you know, show what a MUAC is and measure the arm and say, okay, you need to help me understand when the crop is coming in, when it's going to be the lean season, if the crop is good or not. And then I can help you doing the screening. And so in that, what Freire talked about, Paulo Freire, the famous Brazilian educator, is the idea of a shared mastery. And we don't do this enough. 
and we would learn so much from the people closest uh, to, to uh, the suffering. And so I think, you know, really when we think of the the privilege that we have as physicians, as nurses, um, as, as people who are not suffering deeply, um, really trying to look both at that decolonization framework and also at uh, frameworks of feminism and mutuality. Just to mention that uh, I think necropolitics has so shaped our health sector in the United States. Um, during the period of enslavement, people um, lived 28 years shorter. Um, Post-emancipation, there was massive starvation. Um, Jim Crow and continued the life expectancy shortening, mass incarceration, of course. Um, and um, now we know uh, from an article that came out last week that um, the uh, African-American men in COVID are suffering from a three year shorter life expectancy. We also see in the United States, this concept of space um, that Fadon talked about and how you need to have the segregation. And interestingly, this is a Trump golf course in, in uh, Palm Beach County, California, and uh, right above it on the right hand corner is the jail, the Palm Beach County Jail. So, you know, what, what does this mean to programs? And I think it means a lot. It means a lot to us to think about that. So we were asked by the governor of Massachusetts to stand up um, a statewide contact tracing program and uh, to help the, Depart the Department of Public Health because they were so overwhelmed because our public sector has been so gutted as we well know in the United States. And so we always work partners in health in two spheres. One is supporting the government and the second is really working with the community. So we said, sure, we'll help the Department of Public Health but we really wanna know how people are faring, right? It's not only do you have COVID or not but um, how are you, right? And so we put together a program uh, that is called the Community Tracing Collaborative, and it has three tiers of, um, of, of people. Uh, one are the case investigators, and they're often the people that have the most epidemiologic knowledge. They'll go through the, the um, you know, what are the risks, et cetera. So somebody is uh, a test positive and they will get a phone call. They enumerate the contacts. And then someone will call, sometimes it's the same person, call the contact tracers and say, now you're a contact. These are the things you need to do, right? You need to wear a mask, stay six feet away, wash down the counters with bleach, uh, not share utensils, not share bathroom. But then is the key question. That, that's the question about mutuality. That's the question about learning. We say, can you do that? And if the answer is no, then that's where this framework of mutual support kicks in. And so the third cadre is the care resource coordination. And those people would get food or transport, would get um, primary care doctors for people, would try to help them apply for unemployment insurance, SNAP. And it's really in that space that you start looking at those lines of fracture um, among the poor, among the unhoused. Um, and of course you have a higher rate of people of color, of migrants. And so as we started to stand up this program in, uh, in Massachusetts, which was very large, uh, we started getting called from cities and states around the country to help them. Um, and so this became really our main focus was the contact, contact tracing for communities of color, marginalized people and with care coordination so that we centered that mutuality. So we first of all started with the spaces that were colonized, the spaces that were oppressed, and then really worked on this care and mutuality framework. So in Massachusetts, and we are uh, one of the richest states and the richest country in the world, fully 12% of people needed a lot of help. Um, and the help they needed were water, housing, um, access to their other medicines, groceries, baby diapers, um, you name it. 
Um, our resource coordinator spoke 23, speak 23 different languages. Many of them are retired social workers, nurses, some are public health, but some are people, members of the community who are very well connected. 25% of our worker, workforce were people who were on the verge of being laid off from federally qualified community health centers because our incentives in medicine are so messed up that they were in the middle of a crisis losing their jobs. And often they're from the communities, the hardest communities, which is where most FQHCs are. Um, so um, this is uh, one of my colleagues who was a care resource coordinate, uh, coordinator, Alex Miaman. Um, he was able to arrange for $7,000 to be transferred to a family from members of the community uh, through working with churches in that community to make sure they could have a funeral and pay some of the ex expenses at the person's death. So this was a really, this was really a significant kind of support for very poor and marginalized people. <clears throat> So one of the places uh, we chose to work, we were asked to work in a lot of places, but we chose places that had these same kind of social forces. Um, and one was by invitation of a group called the Coalition of Immokalee Workers, which is an organized group of farm workers, um, where, uh, you know, in the state of Florida, um, the governor is not interested in the humanity of these people. And so the results were being hidden, they weren't being tested, they weren't being offered vaccines, even if they met the criteria. And so we have worked with this coalition to organize a strong community team that includes community health workers. And the very first vaccination clinic they had, and there are many farm workers that are over 65, in fact, the very first vaccination clinic they had was filled up immediately by wealthy people coming from Naples. Uh, you had to sign up on the internet. Um, it was only in English. And so um, by working with the federally qualified health center, going through and getting the ages of people, and we hired and trained community health workers from Immokalee, Florida, many of whom were farm workers themselves, um, we were able to turn out huge numbers of farm workers who were over 65 who could be vaccinated in the next clinic. But it took a ton of community and grassroots organization to do that. The other thing, uh, because in the farm worker communities, you have such overcrowding, people live in trailers of 10 to 15 people in a three bedroom trailer. Um, we, we had to do a lot to get people support if they were quarantined or isolating, uh, including food uh, and working with a local church, we were able to do that. Um, you know, one of the work uh, areas we're super proud of the work is in Newark, New Jersey, uh, where Mayor Ross Baraka, who is a champion for the people of Newark, um, placed a moratorium on evictions. And then working with the Department of Public Health, Dr. Mark R Wade, they were able to rent two hotels to put every single homeless person in a hotel for the duration of the pandemic. And so, um, it's amazing in a city that had the highest rate of homelessness in all of New Jersey. There are no, there's nobody living on the street right now. And all of these people have gotten flu shots and they will be among the first to be vaccinated. So I'm just gonna end by saying, when we look at the mess <laughs> in the United States, that the thing that has struck all of us at Partners in Health most is the work that needs to be done has to be based on reparations. Uh, when you see the terrible intergenerational inequality, it is, it's impossible to make this up um, you know, without massive wealth transfer. And um, in Boston, we had a Boston Globe article that showed the average asset for a white family was uh, almost $250,000 household assets and in a black family is $8. So, we cannot look at this in any other way than a social medicine framework. And um, while I am not a uh, scientist, I am a social scientist, and I and I hope that going forward we can use novel frameworks and social science frameworks to really evaluate uh, these um, epidemics. Because you know, pandemic preparedness as an objective thing is obviously wrong. 
because if you just look at the inputs to the United States system, we looked the best in the world. And without inherent, a analyzing the inherent racism and political economy of the space, we can't be prepared. And so we think part of the, one of the most important parts of preparedness in the United States is reparations and dealing with um, you know, restitution and improvement of the lives of the poor in the United States. Thank you very much. Wonderful, thanks, Dr. Mukherjee. Very thought provoking and really helpful in articulating more holistic social science approaches to address health inequities. Next, we are very honored to have Professor Agnes Benaguajo, the Vice Chancellor and co-founder of the University of Global Health Equity in Rwanda, an initiative of Partners in Health. I must say, previously, Dr. Benaguajo served the Rwandan health sector in high-level government positions for many years, first as the Executive Secretary of Rwanda's National AIDS Control Commission, then as Permanent Secretary of the Minister of Health, and lastly, as Minister of Health. We're very lucky to have her today. Dr. Benaguajo, please. Hello, everyone. Thank you for having me on a panel that is addressing this important topic of equity. In today's presentation, I want to talk to you about the responsibility of funders in achieving global health equity and decolonizing global health. My main objective is to examine the contribution of funders in global health for developing countries and the impact they have on decolonization and on colonization of global health, we will explore how and why these funders can fulfill their responsibilities of ensuring their actions are strictly guided by principle of equity and discuss how their support can be used to maximize the sustainable development of the capacity and the dignity of researchers, clinicians, program managers, and other workers in global health in the global south, while contributing to inclusion and wellness of the vulnerable. Next slide. First, let me look with you at the flow of money. The, expect the expectation is always that the North is supporting the South. However, the amount of money that is going out of the South in support of the North is often, often underestimated, especially in Africa. The continent lose 50 million to 100 million every year as the there is more money going out than coming in. We have to acknowledge this exploitation and challenge the North-South paradigm. We know that the West is interfering in political, social, and family contexts for their economic interest. As shown by the amount of money flowing out of the South to the North in general, this is due to the global structural violence that is still on force today by international institutions based on racist theory that are built on toxic pseudo-scientific lie to maintain and obtain more power and to continue exploiting and stealing wealth from the global south. Looking especially within the health sector, on average, it costs each African country between $21,000 to $59,000 to train a medical doctor, but Africa lose around 2 billion through brain drain from the health sector annually, the health sector only. The West is significantly benefiting from this, but not much is done to change it. It is known since years. For instance, one out of 10 doctors working in UK are from Africa, save, making UK saving 2.7 billion in training costs. When, when it is a football player, the entity welcoming a fully educated player pays 
for the transfer, but in health sector, you welcome people educated at high cost out of the taxes of poor people and nothing is done to reimburse the country who have educated the, the health professionals and the country lost their investment. First, we need to make sure we are on the same page when it comes to principle of global health equity. Global health as the name, as the name suggests, is characterized by a global approach to the provision of health services, but by using biosocial perspective that comprise both biological and social approach to disease and an holistic approach to prevention, treatment, and care. Global health also requires a strict focus on equity by providing services to all with a focus on the vulnerable. We also need to leverage academia and funding to understand and solve global issues and build resilience based on the implementation of the five S, creating system, creating the space, buying and provide the staff, educate the staff and support to care delivery for the vulnerable and for people to come and access care. Now we can look especially at global health funding. By 2022, global health spending is projected to increase by 10 trillion. However, this amount does not always mean that the most pressing issues are addressed. Let us look at the Western world global health funding. Their priorities are HIV, uh, through global fund, maternal and child health to many partners, malaria to global fund and uh, um, the malaria uh, emergency plan from um, uh, the US and others. However, you can see in the graph below that cardiovascular disease and other non-communicable disease are on top of the list. This mismatch is partially because West considers that non-communicable disease are problem of rich people and refuse to be guided by science and evidence and responds to the request of countries to help them to support non-communicable diseases. We can also look at funding of regulatory agencies such as the World Health Organization. Since April 2020, WHO is largely funded by Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, followed by the German and the US. This structure of funding highlights some key issues with funding and efficacy. First, the earlier decision of the US to redraw show that WHO's funding is the pending of member countries' political agenda, not on advancing health worldwide. Second, giving the influence of large donor on the WHO, this, this exists, uh, this ex show that there is an existence of an unequal distribution of decision-making power. There are also several issues with efficacy. First, a third of this allocated money given to WHO is retained by the headquarters when it is supposed to contributing to country's health system. Moreover, those highly paid experts at WHO promote double standards. For instance, suggesting that certain drugs are too expensive to be provided in low and mid income countries, even though they can save lives, with the belief that the substandard is good enough in low and income countries. Even when the Western world decides to reverse the flow of money 
Aid to the South is used as a powerful tool of neocolonization. Funders practice conditionalities and vertical funds that limit countries on what and how they use the money. Recipients are forced to buy goods and services from donors' countries, even if they can find better and cheaper elsewhere. This is a hidden subsidy of the donor-owned institutions. Some forms of aid perpetuate the colonial mentality, conceive convincing people that professional in the global South cannot make their own decisions and need help from the West. Moreover, there is often a disconnect between funders' priority and the challenges on the ground in the global South. This pattern of paternalism means that funders are often unwilling to fund local organization. The West creates rules and propose and purpose uh, so that civil society, academic and government organization from the global South do not develop their capacity. They help the North confirm a fictional reality that low income countries are incapable of contributing to the growth of their own people. They continuously adapt old excuse or giving various new ones to avoid funding local organization. Despite this challenge, we have seen a growth in North-South partnership. These partnerships are aimed at sharing knowledge and expertise and providing opportunities for researchers because of the shortage of skilled professionals in the global south. For instance, Africa represents 12.5% of the world's population, but only contribute to 1% of the total global research output. This is partially because many migrants, African scientists, contribute to research in the north that is not capitalized for the south. Lastly, this partnership allow for a focus on issues that are relevant to global health in the north, in the south, sorry. Despite the need of north-south partnership, various limitations exist. Institutions from the global south are often required to have a global north partner as the lead investigators in research suggesting that those from the South are not competent. Moreover, there are significant power imbalance. Execution of the project and the area of investigation is often determined by the Global North partner, leading to research that does not address the community's needs. Funding is managed by Global North partners, despite the program being in the Global South. For the Global South, this fuel the colonialist mindset that indivi individuals and organization in the Global South are incapable of leading their own projects. Despite these challenges, when these partnerships are successful, we see astonishing results. Here, I will give you the example of the Human Resource for Health program in Rwanda where the government of Rwanda partner, partnered with 23 US institutions of higher education for health, funded by the US government to train students and medical educators. The goal was to address the shortage of quality health professionals and the inadequate management of health facilities and to create a pool of health educators to solve the problem. This successful partnership increased the number of health professionals in general. And just for an example, the number of specialized doctor, doctors increased from 150 in 2011 to 567 by the end of 2019. One of the reasons that Human Resource for Health was successful 
was because Rwanda had a strict aid policy that addressed the limitation of North-South partnership. The policy provided clear requirement for any foreign partner requiring them to work according to national regulation and in line with the na nation priorities. This is why the Human Resource for Health program was designed by the government of Rwanda instead of its US partners. When working in partnership with governments and communities, funders need to understand their line of accountability. This will align their priorities and ensure that the goal of global health equity are met. They will understand to who and what are the responsibility of each and every one. Who are the beneficiaries to who they will turn for support for quality, to ensure quality and equitable prevention care treatment service for all. Equity and accountability, not only for local organization, for the donor as well, and for the beneficiary as well. Funders also need to fund equity-focused projects. And this means focusing on the vulnerable because including the vulnerable foster economic development. Second, evidence has shown that when you invest in health for the vulnerable, there is a significant return in investment. For example, for every dollar invested in health, there is an estimate fourfold economic return. Moreover, for every $1 invested in a high quality early child program, childhood program, there is four to nine US dollar return, meaning that investment in vulnerable populations such as children provide a lot of return. It is important to acknowledge the role of key players and attribute their responsibility and success accordingly. Governments are legally responsible to protect the human rights to health through infrastructure and capacity building, and as well as system strengthening. However, they do not work alone. Local NGOs and faith-based organizations should be include, included in decision-making to improve the health of communities they serve. The donors contribute to the national health agenda through funding and implementation support. They should favor the use of national channels and rules to at the same time, strengthening the health sector and strengthening the national challenge, uh, channels for economic management. Where they are the most needed, they should also go there. Often, they like to go in specific districts, not where the needed is the big. The private sector needs to work alongside the public sector to provide health services. Through private-public partnership, the private sector plays a key role in filing, in, in filing the gap in health service provision. We need to understand the role of all stakeholders and stop the mentality of always attributing success to Western savior. A lot is due to the country members themselves. In order to ensure sustainability in funding, there must be collaboration. Funders need to integrate activities into a country national plan work on area identified by national government in partnership with their communities and trust them to do what is best for them. Donors and implementing partners in the country must work together to avoid loss of opportunities and ensure that programs do not overlap. Second, we must 
pay attention to how the funding works. Save life now, yes, always. While strengthening the health sector, yes, always. This means adopting an horizontal approach and also funding local organizations because these remain in the country during health crisis and are more familiar with local setting. COVID has shown us that. At alert, many NGOs has run, have run away or has their people to run away. For 60 years, the model currently used by many has been proven multiple times that it's a failure and that during health crisis, most international organization always chose to leave. But this model is continued. If we want system to function with equity at the front point, we need to fund global health education that reinforce the ideals and equity and teach students to recognize and address vulnerabilities. We need to teach inclusiveness with a focus on strategies that benefit the most vulnerable. We also need to provide accessibility to quality education by addressing financial, geographic, and social and cultural barriers. We also need to build research capacity to ensure improvement in implementation of evidence-based intervention for the vulnerable according to the local context. And we, and we need to educate leaders all the teaching that it's need for that need to be focused on promoting leadership with a mission and a vision of equity. To achieve sustainable health equity, we must invest in human capital by funding proximate and accessible global health education in the global south. A majority currently, a majority of global health education costs are located in the Western world and their financial model makes them unaffordable for people from the south where the needed are the most. This has been evidenced by a study published in, by, uh, by BMG. 88% of global health master program allocated in high income countries and their tuition costs make them un inaccessible for those in low income countries. At the University of Global Health Equity, with its beautiful campus located in rural northern Rwanda, as you can see in the first picture here, we are combating inequities through reimagining global health education. We teach and train the next generation of global health leaders to respond to the future health threat without leaving anyone behind, nationally and globally, with a focus on vulnerable applying the principle of global health we have discussed in the beginning and with purposeful preparation based on evidence-based intervention. And we are proud to say that what we teach, we have success to show to our students life. We never closed during COVID-19 pandemic with no cause or enrollment of students facing delay. And keeping a campus COVID free. I want to recall that the first case of COVID was in March, 2020. In the southern picture, you can see our students and staff participating in community services to help in agriculture and also building houses. To have successful funded project, we must focus on multilateral partnership quality services based on inclusiveness, participation, equity, recipient ownership, creating institutions that keep funders accountable, access the impact of the funding, access, assess, sorry, the impact of funding by true assessment before and after and during, coordinate integrated planning, implementation, and monitoring and evaluation. Embed the funding in economic development and poverty reduction plan of the country. 
work for continuous improvement of beneficiaries to be able one day to do what you do for them and to do that even better and that as soon as possible. All these efforts should focus on the most vulnerable and support national institutions. The only way to address these challenges that how to make sure that support and funds coming from the north doesn't contribute to neo-colonialism, perpetuating colonialism, but contribute to decolonization of global health is not to remain quiet when you see it. Do not stay silent. Instead, speak up against exploitative funders or funders who have goodwill, but by negligence are simply perpetuating the power dynamics out north relation and st stop the cycle of promoting the growth of the south and in place are promoting western supremacy when you request funding apply for a grant do not assume you know all answers are found in communities seek guidance and listen to people from the global south with humility and old funders accountable to apply the principle of global health when they give funds to make sure that they promote development and wellness of the vulnerable, that they promote respect, value, the vulnerable as well as, well as the knowledge and skill transfer should are in the center of the fund and the support they give. So of all your funding, as well as all funding you request and decision you take, follow those principles. And finally, always refuse double standards. This is based on racism. This is based on the core of what colonialism is subject of addressing funders' responsibility to achieve global health equity is relevant today more than ever. As you can see from this graph, less than 1% of global development assistance for health distributed in low and mid-income countries during COVID pandemic. Only 1% of it were used for preparedness and response to the pandemic. This is $374 million out of $41 billion. So as we respond to this pandemic and prepare for the future one, which we know will come, we need to ensure that the role of funders for global health vis-a-vis -vis the global south aligns more with the need of the global south and contribute more to global health equity and to decolonize global health. I thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Benaguajo, for your unique perspective and really bold vision for what must be done to make meaningful change. Now we have Dr. Mauricio Maza, Executive Director of Basic Health International. Dr. Maza's focus is cervical cancer prevention in low resource settings, specifically with the use of novel technologies, technologies and treatment paradigms. Dr. Maza has been an advisor and co-investigator on several NIH funded research projects, including in El Salvador, Peru, Colombia, and China. Over to you, Dr. Maza. Uh, good morning, everyone. It's a real pleasure for me to be here with so many distinguished uh, colleagues in, in this panel. I'm very honored and humbled to be part of it. I want to thank the Center for Global Health Studies, Forward International the NIH, the Consortium of Universities for Global Health uh, for allowing us to be part of, of, of this panel and, and showcasing the importance of addressing global health inequities. Um, 
So I'm gonna talk a little bit about how cervical cancer research is facilitating access to care in El Salvador. To begin with, I have to say that there's no, I have no commercial relationship with any corporate entity that produces or sells products related to HPV. Uh, I work for Basic Health International. Um, our vision is to live in a world where no woman dies of cervical cancer, uh, which is a preventable disease. And our mission is to eliminate cervical cancer globally. These are some of the countries that we have consulted, worked on, or shared our experiences. We're constantly trying to learn about programs, and we know that every country is different. And within that concept, we know that the disparities in health are different uh, depending on the countries and the resources and the social determinants of health and populations. So um, I think talking about cervical cancer, starting uh, sharing some slides from colleagues from WHO uh, gives an example of, of the importance of inequity. Um, and uh, talking a little about the elimination strategy in May, 2018, uh, Dr. Tedros, the WHO Director General, made a call for action to eliminate cervical cancer. In January of 2019, this uh, was supported by over 70 countries. And last year, in November 17 of last year, the strategy to accelerate the elimination of cervical cancer was launched. So basically, what's the objective of this strategy of to eliminate cervical cancer. It has three uh, pillars to get to the threshold for elimination, which is an uh, incidence of less than four cases per 100,000 women. To get there, uh, we want to hit three specific targets for 2030. Um, that is 90% of girls fully vaccinated by the age of 15. 70% of women screened with a high performance test, at least uh, by 35 and 45 years of age. And then following up women with cervical cancer disease, whether this is pre-cancer or if this is cancer, uh, we have to ensure that they receive treatment. Um, and this slide really talks about what the reason we're here today, and it's how there's this growing inequities of cervical cancer around the world. There are clear disparities in incidence and mortality worldwide, and we know that the vast majority of women are dying from low and middle income countries. And as a whole, we can see how Africa is affected, and this is due mainly to it, the high burden of HIV in this, which is another group uh, that really needs to be looked at. Uh, because we know that this is population uh, attributable factor for this disease. So um, understanding the problem and seeing the disparities, um, it, in this following a graph, we can see that variability depending on the resources that a country has. Uh, we can have uh, uh, examples of where in North America, uh, the USA is very close to getting to that threshold that we're discussing. And then if we go to Central America, uh, where I'm from, you could see how the H standard rate starts to increase. And if we go to Africa, we can see that difference. So there's that huge difference, right? And it, and it has to do with access to health. And I'd be, I wanna be very clear, you know, I think when we talk about disparities, it doesn't matter whether you are in the United States or you're in El Salvador, uh, you know, the, the lives of women are equally, uh, for me, they, they, they're equally important. You know, obviously, uh, there are areas in the world that need more of our attention. Um, but I think uh, it's very important that we don't forget that even in high resource places, there's always disparities that need to be addressed. So uh, thinking, thinking of this, uh, we know that inequity and distribution of resources designated to specific health interventions can also be seen in minority groups within already vulnerable populations. So uh, that's uh, the talk that I was gonna give uh, 
without going into COVID had to do with how cervical cancer has helped us, research has helped us uh, increase access for vulnerable populations. Um, and like I said, within already uh, uh, places with uh, limited resources, there are minority groups that could be affected. And that's uh, what the study that we have published from self-sampling in transgender men showed. So I'm gonna quickly go through the presentation of of how I would present a lot of this data, but make highlight some things that are important or that really, I think, makes a difference on how we must see this as far as uh, inequity uh, in, in healthcare uh, has to be discussed. Um, we know that um, transgender men have uh, limited information on cervical cancer. We know that the pap smears uh, probably have a lot of unsatisfactory screening results. So we decided to do a pilot on transgender men in El Salvador. Its main aim was to see whether self-sampling uh, would be something that they would be willing to do and uh, also evaluate other clinical, uh, clinical and lab uh, evaluations based on the use of testosterone therapy. So again, uh, we partner with uh, a group of transgender men that's called Generacion Hombres Trans. And we worked with them, developed the communication and, and developed uh, all the materials that would be used uh, for enrollment. So basically it's a small group of 35 uh, transgender men that we could identify of which 24 were able to be part of it. Uh, there were different steps from a survey where we would get a lot of their demographic, health and sexual behaviors, physical examination, lab tests, um, and, 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 and EKG, densitometry. And after that, uh, we would offer uh, cervical cancer screening with a self-sample of uh, HPV test. And whoever was positive to HPV would have a pelvic exam uh, through uh, a colposcope. So to do this, we modified a lot of the self-sampling materials that we had specifically with, the, with, with their feedback on how this would have to look uh, for transgender men. And more than the, what the results were, where it was very well accepted, um, uh, we, we did not find any high-grade disease, just a low-grade disease. But um, understanding what they had to say, how they felt, that it was difficult to decide, but that when they knew that um, uh, when they knew that uh, it would be self-exam, everything was different, and that they would recommend to somebody else. Um, this is something that we thought could be used um, in other populations if we scale this, this pilot up um, and also try to control how they're self-medicating uh, in a lot of these instances. But the most, I think out of the whole uh, study, what really impacted me at the time, and this is a picture with uh, members of the transgender community and members of, of Basic Health International. Um, and it was the fact that um, I remember we were, uh, we were seeing them and, and some of them were, it was clear that they were impacted uh, emotionally. Um, and I felt really bad at the time. I wasn't sure if we were doing something wrong, if, 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 if uh, this, was, this was making them feel uncomfortable. And um, somebody was really, it was clear they were crying. So we asked him, um, you know, is everything okay? What can we do for you? And the reason they were crying was because they've never been treated so well. And that really impacted us because for us, it was just standard of care that we were providing. Um, and for them, it, it, you know, it, it, it made a world of a difference. So um, it's very hard to th think about all the things that happen and how people are treated equally when looking for health services that should be essential for everyone. The other group that we, we uh, reached out to were women that were reluctant to screening. Uh, through cervical cancer. This was through the Rising Tide Foundation support. And um, we did this study of self-sampling to evaluate the feasibility of women that on the cervical cancer prevention project that we have with the Ministry of Health in El Salvador, 
uh, that women had not showed up and see whether if we would provide self-sampling, um, it could be easier uh, to have access. So basically, in this case, we hired a female study uh, of health, health workers to visit women at their homes and, and uh, homes and uh, do questions and offer them um, self-sampling with HPV. If they were positive, they would be sent uh, for treatment, and if not, they would be followed up. So this this is the part of uh, of, of not we're thinking this yeah. is vulnerable populations. This is these are women in mainly rural 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 urban marginal areas. Um, but we encountered ourselves with a problem, and it's the violence in El Salvador. And we ended up uh, randomizing who would go based on violence indicators, which, which you know, even as, as we look at it and go back at it, it's, it's really unfortunate because um, women that lived in areas of ver very high violence are, are, are not receiving the treatment that they should be receiving, right? We had to do it obviously for safety reasons because we couldn't have our personnel go in there. Uh, it would be very, uh, it was completely unsafe to do that. But, you know, it just makes you think that you know how vulnerable within this same populations we have more vulnerable populations, and 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 how all these determinants of violence uh, are affecting how women can get their management. So you know, out of the what we got out of this study was that over ninety percent of women uh, that were reluctant to screening actually got screened through self sampling. Um, as far as education, we can see, and this is where the social determinants of health, and we see how education plays a role in a lot of, probably a lot of the women that were reluctant to screening. Um, most of them had non or just elementary school education in this case, and about how they felt uh, they were embarrassed about being seen by a male physician. That was one of the reasons why uh, they did not attend during the first screening round. So why would they accept? We had a lot of reasons with, they felt less embarrassed, felt more comfortable, it was easy. So it's how do we get those services, again, to the women that are most needed and how do we use this evidence to then put it into policy to ensure that women can get the access that they require for health. And that's important, I think, um, again, you know, because of the high violence we had to modify a lot of what we would we would we would like to do, um, and we need to think about how can we improve that. But as part of this study, with this we can go back to the Ministry of Health and say, you need to use self sampling in women that are reluctant to screening that are potentially at a very high risk of getting cervical cancer, and this is an option to do that. So it's a kind of a uh, uh, that's the the what we're trying, we have to do, we have to look for interventions to close that gap of equity on, on, on health care services and change policy uh, to ensure that everyone has the same right. Now, when we leave a little of the research side of it and we go back to where we are with the elimination strategy specifically on the screening and the follow-up of women, um, we can go back and I can go back a couple of years and tell you that you know we worked in different areas of El Salvador. You can see here areas where women would get screened, then they would get triage and treated if they were HPV positive. We have a screen and treat uh, guidelines in the country for primary HPV testing followed by cryotherapy. We also have that on the other side of the country, Oriental region. So this was a project, the CAPE project took a lot of years um, to start. First, it was a pilot, and then it started to get implement scale. And now uh, it's it's been going from one area to the country to other to where we are at this point in uh, starting 2020. Um, and it's basically a scale to a country -like level. Now that leads to approximately 80 to 100,000 women that had to be screened between 2019 and 2020. And then of course, COVID hit, right? So what does this affect us from an implementation point of view? And, um, and we're, 
when we're looking at um, the different studies from our colleagues at IARC, they did a survey on limited uh, income countries and um, they, they asked, you know, how is this affecting your screening? And we can see that a lot of them, uh, whether they had suspended screening, a lot of them had, had suspended their screening uh, during the, the, the pandemic. And then the question was, uh, what about the diagnostic services? And, and then you can see it's also affected until the point of like status of uh, treatment services for cancer. But the screening side of this is the one that you, we can clearly see that it's more affected, right? And that's been seen all over the place followed by the diagnosis and treatment. So if you can see here, the testing diagnosis and treatment it's a, it's a big chunk that's under that 50% um, um, of how it was affected compared to before pre-COVID and post-COVID. So now we have, out of those women that needed to be screened by the time COVID hits, over 5,000 women that actually, over, over 5,000 women that actually need to get treated um, and that, and, and that um, need that services and it's not available at the time. So um, what we get here is uh, support from a foundation to follow up on a lot of those women um, and set up colposcopy clinics uh, that will enable women to access care. And um, that um, if it wasn't for that, they would not be able to do that. And uh, they're able to uh, not only access care, but also uh, enroll in study that's being conducted that can allow women to come to uh, San Salvador, where a lot of the where we have a study running and where treatment can be given to them in case they would have an invasive cancer. So um, this is how we're trying to advance uh, and support all of these problems that are being affected uh, of services that are being affected during the due to the COVID pandemic. So out of those 5,000 women, we hope that uh, we'll have management within the next six months. And that's, that's, that's pretty fantastic. I hope that we can accomplish that. And as we move forward, um, I think that we need to be aware that COVID has created a great impact in non-communicable diseases, not only cancer, but all NCDs. We must find ways to reach those that are most in need, and we need to minimize inequities in health, right? I mean, that's, that's very important. There is a need to reinforce our health systems to ensure that we're able to happen, that that can happen. And, you know, in the middle of this pandemic, we need to understand that all efforts add up. And we need to think of policy. Uh, that's the important thing. We have to think about what policy we can do, we can implement to change to get to those that are in need and to ensure that uh, we are addressing this global health inequities that, that we're currently living as we move forward. And I just want to finish up with a picture uh, in El Salvador during the launch of the cervical cancer elimination launch, which highlights the 90, 70, 90 pillars. Um, I want to thank uh, I want to thank everyone for, for your attention and for, uh, again, I want to thank uh, the Center for Global Health Studies and the Consortium of University for Global Health and the NIH uh, for inviting me to give this talk. Thank you. Many thanks, Dr. Maza. We're very grateful for your focus on how actually the conduct of research can reduce different disparities related to health. Thank you so much. We now turn to Dr. Monica Webb Hooper, Deputy Director of the National Institute on Minority Health and Health Disparities. Dr. Webb Hooper works closely with the director to oversee all aspects of the Institute and supports the implementation of initiatives to improve minority health, reduce health disparities and promote health equity. She also co-leads working groups for NIH-wide initiatives to understand and address the disproportionate impacts of COVID-19 among populations with health disparities. Dr. Webb Hooper, please. Thank you very much for that kind introduction 
And thanks to the fantastic presenters who are contributing to this very important session. So I want to talk about a few areas, um, health disparities, COVID-19, NIH initiatives to address structural racism, and opportunities to support diverse cohorts of scientists. Before I get started, just an FYI. So I'm here to focus primarily on the science of minority health and health disparities in the United States. The National Institute on Minority Health and Health Disparities has a mission to work across NIH and the Department of Health and Human Services more generally to advance the science of health disparities and to move us closer to meaningful progress. While we do have a US domestic agenda, we also collaborate with Fogarty International Center on scientific initiatives that are consistent with our overall mission. As we move into this presentation, I offer a few key definitions for context. The first is population differences or characteristic differences between population groups, such as prevalence, and, and the key is the linkage to genetics or biology or geographic location. Gene environment interactions happen and translate into differences in disease susceptibility. So a few examples would be sex differences in color blindness or the greater prevalence of sickle cell anemia among Americans of African descent or Mediterranean heritage as good examples of population differences. Health disparities are distinct from population differences in one key way. And that is that disadvantage is the causative agent. Disadvantage at multiple levels, such as the social, economic, and environmental levels. The populations who experience health disparities are those who have faced systematically greater obstacles to optimal health and can be characterized in a number of ways, including race, ethnicity, socioeconomic status, gender, sexual orientation, and others. Groups that are often discriminated against or excluded. And importantly, and in contrast to population differences, health disparities are differences that should not exist and are modifiable, which means that we have the opportunity for change. Another important term is social determinants of health. They refer to conditions in the environment in which people are born, live, learn, work, play, worship, and age that affect a wide range of health functioning and quality of life outcomes and risks. The word conditions is important to note. It is the conditions of our environment and interactions that affect our physical, mental, emotional, and material statuses. So social determinants of health are not negative per se, although this is commonly how they are discussed in the literature. Some determinants increase the odds of good health, such as clean air, water, great school systems, and appropriate social support. The goal is for everyone to have protective social determinants in their lives consistently. And importantly, the social determinants are mostly place-based and are thus modifiable. That means that those determinants that lead to adverse impacts on health and those that facilitate health disparities, again, do not have to exist and they can be modified. Examples of social determinants include the availability of healthy foods, opportunities for high quality education and employment, access to quality healthcare, public safety, safe and affordable housing, social norms and attitudes such as discrimination and racism, and the built environment. So these and other social determinants combine to influence health outcomes. Health equity. Last term I wanted to find to start this is often a term that can be used interchangeably with health disparities, or it is often, but it's distinct. Health equity is the aspiration. It's the highest level of health for all people. To achieve health equity requires that we close the gaps, which are healthcare disparities, that we value everyone equally, that we address avoidable inequalities, and that we provide supports that are proportional to the needs and that we remove barriers to optimal health. And we study health disparities because the significant scientific and medical advances that have been made have not benefited all populations. This is the wicked problem that needs to be fixed. And it's beyond time to accelerate meaningful progress 
and move into third and fourth generation health disparity science. I think of first generation health disparities research as the initial step for understanding what health disparities exist, documenting their prevalence. Second generation health disparities research is the study of contributing factors and mechanisms underlying risks. Third generation health disparities research is developing and testing interventions that reduce and ultimately eliminate them. And the fourth generation of health disparities research involves population level implementation, uptake, and the application of a true health equity lens from the start of our efforts to their sustained completion. And from where I sit, that's where we need to go from here. There are considerable racial and ethnic health disparities in most conditions in the US. These disparities include shorter life expectancy, higher rates of cardiovascular disease, cancer, diabetes, infant mortality, stroke, cognitive impairment, asthma, sexually transmitted infections, and dental diseases, and also differences in the prevalence and outcomes of mental illness. So looking more closely at life expectancy, Data on overall life expectancy indicate that African-American males have the lowest life expectancy and Latino males have the longest. The same pattern by race ethnicity is observed among women. When we look at socioeconomic factors, we can see in this figure that there is a strong negative gradient in the risk of all-cause mortality in the United States by annual household income level. These data were from 2016, and they show that the risk of death from any cause is three times greater among individuals whose household income is less than $25,000 per year. So income alone is independently related to life and death. This is the NIMHD Minority Health and Health Disparities Research Framework. It reflects an evolving conceptualization of factors relevant to the understanding and promotion of minority health and to the understanding and reduction of health disparities. Much of the research in this field has focused on individual level biological mechanisms, what I have in the purple box, as an explanation for poor health among minoritized groups and for disparities. And as you can see, a singular focus on biology and genetics misses the great complexity and understanding of how we address health disparities and does not span the other domains of influence, such as behavioral, physical, or built environment, sociocultural environment, or healthcare system, or the other levels of influence, that is interpersonal, community, and societal within these domains. We have to think bigger and more holistically, and we have to study the same way. There are real potential consequences for studying health disparities from a simply biomedical lens, for instance, within genetic science and genomics, which tends to include the concept of race to measure human biological difference. And the concern is that this perpetuates a false belief by some that differences in disease outcomes stems primarily from inherent pathophysiological differences between what are social categories. Researchers and community leaders have raised concern that the consequences of the reliance on the biology of race are many and lead to the promotion of eugenics, misattributions about health disparities, a lack of progress in addressing health disparities, and that this represents deficit models and reductionist approaches, and that this focus prevents us from considering the roles of upstream determinants of health and life expectancy. So COVID-19 for many has been the first time that we've watched a new wave of health disparities unfold in real time. COVID-19 is globally devastating and has helped medicine begin to rethink the biomedical model of health, the roles of genetics and genomics in the health of minoritized populations and in health disparities. Compared to white individuals, in the United States, COVID-19 cases are 1.9 times higher among, African, um, among American Indian or Alaska Native person. Hospitalizations are over three times higher among Hispanic or Latino individuals. And deaths are nearly two times greater among Black or African-American persons. 
There are two overarching possibilities for racial and ethnic disparities in COVID-19 cases and outcomes. Medical comorbidities is the answer we hear and read about most often from scientists, physicians, and health officials. Racial ethnic minorities indeed have a disproportionate burden of underlying comorbidities. The problem with this explanation, however, is that it is absent the full context of the pandemic. Race is a socio-cultural construct, not a biological or genetic one. And race is important to study because it shapes the lived experiences and thus the health of all groups. So it's important that we zoom out to view the full context, which includes systemic factors such as historical and ongoing discrimination and chronic stress and its effects on immunologic functioning and health. So here's a model that I developed to help me think about factors that contribute directly to COVID-19 cases and outcomes. COVID-19 is illustrative of the overarching health disparities in the US broadly. These factors can be themed as related to health and health care, socioeconomics, and social determinants of health. And we cannot ignore the backdrop of structural inequities which are associated with poor health outcomes. COVID-19 racial ethnic disparities are driven by differences in exposure. There's a structural issue that is taking place here rather than a biological or a genetic one. So it's time for meaningful change. How can scientists play a role in reaching this goal of health equity? The answer is complex because equity work is hard, but I implore us all to do the work. For the sake of time, I'll offer two areas in which scientists can focus within their domains of control. The first is research and evolving the evidence base, moving us toward that fourth generation toward effective, sustainable interventions that are widely disseminated and infinite. COVID-19 has encouraged a refocus on community-engaged research that is working with the affected communities to develop, execute, and evaluate interventions that resonate and fill the needs. NIH has several significant initiatives ongoing to address the needs of underserved and vulnerable communities, and I'll describe two of them. The first is the Radix Up initiative, and the second is the SEAL initiative. So engagement with the affected communities is a cornerstone of both Radix Up and SEAL. Too few studies include racially and ethnically diverse patients or community members in their development and implementation. And as a result, these acontextually developed interventions may largely benefit health outcomes in one sector of society while inadvertently creating, sustaining, or increasing health disparities in another. We want the hearts of these large community-engaged initiatives to be academic community partnerships for co-producing research for underserved communities through improved health and receipt of high quality care. We're encouraging collaboration, shared decision-making, equitable relationships, co-learning, trust, and transparency. The primary strategies within Radix Up include those listed here, listed here. The overall goal is to increase access and uptake related to COVID-19 testing in underserved populations. I wanted to draw your attention to the purple box, which is the focus of this initiative on understanding the range of factors that contribute to COVID-19 disparities and implementing testing interventions to help reduce them. I also say a little bit about the SEAL initiative. The overarching goal of SEAL is to understand factors that contribute to this disproportionate burden. There are four main goals, which are to address COVID-19 misinformation, to engage trusted voices and community-engaged research teams, to facilitate the enrollment of underrepresented groups in COVID-19 clinical trials, and to invest within the community through a multi-sector alliance committed to the mission of reducing health and other disparities. The SEAL Alliance currently includes 11 states, highlighted in blue here, who were funded this past summer and the Alliance will be expanding shortly. And this work is centered on using our science to serve communities and to help reduce the COVID-19 burden through educational and outreach approaches. NIH also has a new scientific initiative, um, other initiatives I wanna point out that are specifically related to topics of today's session. So this one is an exciting research funding opportunity that will be published shortly around structural racism 
and its impact on minority health and disparities. We have this rare opportunity for NIMHD to lead an NIH-wide initiative on structural racism and discrimination. The goal is to promote the inclusion of structural racism in health research. Racism and discrimination are documented social determinants of health and drivers of health disparities, but are not routinely included in human health research. So we see a need for research that examines and addresses structural racism at the higher levels. And here are examples at the organizational, neighborhood, or community, and societal level. This is an opportunity to not only think outside of the box to understand health, but to build a new one. The purposes of this initiative are to support observational research to understand the role of structural racism in causing and sustaining health disparities. And second, we are interested in research testing interventions that address structural racism in order to improve minority health and reduce disparities. So here's an example of an observational research topic, examining how cumulative and chronic experiences of structural racism impact biological processes that contribute to poor health outcomes. This is an example of a possible uh, intervention study topic. So addressing structural racism in healthcare settings across multiple domains um, to improve care outcomes. So we're excited about this initiative and it has wide support across NIH. And finally, I wanted to make sure you're aware that the NIH has a new initiative to support the NIH Faculty Institutional Recruitment for Sustainable Transformation Program, or the FIRST co cohort program. And this is about addressing structural inequities among scientists per se. So we know that the representation of racial and ethnic minority scientists, particularly African-American or Black, Latino, Native Hawaiian, Pacific Islander, and American Indian, Alaska Native tenure track faculty is just very limited. So NIH is committed to doing what we can to help institutions address this significant concern. So the overall objective of FIRST is to create cultures of inclusive excellence at NIH-funded institutions by implementing a set of well-integrated, evidence-based strategies and evaluating their impact on pre-specified metrics of institutional culture, inclusion, and diversity. We want to see inclusive excellence, which is a philosophical approach to higher education administration and processes that means attending to both the demographic diversity of faculty and students and the need for developing climates and cultures in institutions so that all have a chance to succeed in STEM. The first program will provide one funding mechanism um, with opportunities for highly resourced institutions and limited resource institutions to apply independently or in a partnership to develop and implement faculty cohort models for the simultaneous hiring of a diverse group of research faculty. The overall goals and specific measurable objectives that this program expects to accomplish are in the areas of sustainable institutional culture change, the promotion of inclusive excellence by hiring a diverse cohort of new faculty, um, faculty development, mentoring, sponsorship, and promotion. And each institution will be responsible for evaluating its own first program and sharing with the Data Coordination Center. So this is an opportunity to enhance effort to support the careers of underrepresented faculty. And we are looking for positive and measurable change for the first program grant recipients and hope that other institutions will follow suit toward these goals. So what I hope I've accomplished during this presentation was to identify longstanding and new health disparities, factors that contribute, especially COVID-19, um, as an example, talked about examples of NIH support to address these concerns, highlighted the importance of community-engaged science, building the pathway for investigators trained to do this work, and also described funding opportunities that may be important to offer diversity of thought and scientific innovation. So what do I think is needed to approach the fourth generation of health disparities work? The short answer is that we need to bake in health equity as a key ingredient in all of our scientific diversity and inclusion efforts. 
Advancing this science of health equity means that we are intentional about how we build our training programs, how we engage with communities, and how we develop and execute our science. It means that we plan at the outset how we'll bake equity in as a primary ingredient that will help us lead to the desired recipe outcome. And without doing so, we'll see the effects of that um, because it'll be reflected in the end result. So I'll leave the hardest work to you, challenging you, encouraging you, charging you to formulate new ideas as individuals and as a collective to think about the challenges related to health disparities, minority health science, to plan and execute science with the potential to make a real impact. Challenge us also as humans, individuals, scientists, clinicians, leaders, and as people with the power to make things happen within your multiple domains of influence as we think about the path forward. And I encourage you also to use your passion and perseverance to help ensure that everyone has access to the highest attainable standard of health. I also invite you to connect with NIMHD and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thanks very much, Dr. Webb Hooper. What an exciting and forward-looking vision for health disparities research moving forward. Much appreciated. Finally, we are lucky to have Dr. Satish Gopal to close out the presentations in this session. Dr. Gopal directs the Center for Global Health at the National Cancer Institute, where he works with internal and external partners to support cancer research and research networks, promote cancer control planning, and build capacity in LMICs. Before coming to NIH one year ago, Dr. Gopal was the Cancer Program Director for the University of North Carolina Project Malawi, a collaboration with the Malawi Ministry of Health, where he oversaw a multidisciplinary cancer research portfolio addressing many of the most common cancers in the region. Dr. Gopal. I'd like to start by thanking the organizers for including me on this important panel with some of my global health heroes. My name is Satish Gopal and I direct the Center for Global Health at the United States National Cancer Institute. I would like to speak today about global health inequities specifically related to cancer. Before moving to the NCI one year ago, I spent my entire academic career living and working in Malawi, which I still miss on a daily basis and in many respects still consider home. For context, as this will inform some of my remarks, annual health expenditure per capita in Malawi is approximately 35 US dollars. During the period that I was living in Malawi, I was the only medical oncologist working in a country of approximately 18 million people, and I worked closely with two clinical oncologist colleagues, which is a slightly different training model that some of you may be familiar with. Although I believed this to some extent, even before I lived in Malawi, my time in Malawi convinced me that cancer is the disease area for which global inequity is greatest. When I would come back to the US for clinical service time, I would attend on patients receiving sophisticated cellular therapies, just as Emily Whitehead had received. Emily, shown at left, may be one of the most famous cancer patients in the world. In 2012, when I was in the process of moving to Malawi with my then five-year-old daughter, Emily was only a couple of years older and became the first child in the world to receive CAR T-cell therapy directed against CD19 for relapsed D-cell acute lymphoblastic leukemia. She nearly died from the immune-mediated cytokine release syndrome, survived when serendipitously given the anti-IL-6 monoclonal antibody tocilizumab, and remains cancer-free now eight years later. She has become an incredibly strong advocate for an example of the direct impact of cancer research on individual patients. Shown at right is the first patient I took care of with BALL after arriving in Malawi in 2012, who not only did not have access to salvage treatments, but who received first-line treatment for his curable cancer under vastly different circumstances and died several months after diagnosis despite our best attempts to care for him.
This inequity, unfortunately, is not a new problem. Emily benefited very directly from the scientific discoveries she contributed to, but that has not been as true for Ugandan children with Burkitt lymphoma over the last 50 years. They contributed to the first identification of a new human tumor in the 1950s, which bears a European's name. And over subsequent decades, the discovery of a new human oncogenic virus, which also now bears European names, the discovery of multi-agent chemotherapy, the discovery of the C-MYC oncogene, and the optimization of therapy based on these biologic insights to achieve amazing results across a broad spectrum of children and adults treated in high income countries. Tragically, these advances were not translated into a broadly deployable curative solution for the very children who initiated this progress. I often say that my career as a physician scientist before coming to the NCI was spent entirely situated on this final missing arrow. And during the period I lived in Malawi, we routinely saw children who presented similarly with similar outcomes to descriptions in the 1950s and 1960s. It's important to note, however, that inequity exists within and not just between countries. These data from the African Breast Cancer Disparities and Outcomes Study demonstrate marked heterogeneity in three-year survival across diverse African settings with similar racial ethnic patterns as the US, meaning that there appears to be a strong association between how dark your skin color is and how well you do after breast cancer, even within Sub-Saharan Africa. Despite fewer resources, low-income countries can also be more equitable than high-income countries in allocating scarce resources. For example, in this 2016 analysis, full course coverage of girls aged 10 to 20 years with the human papillomavirus vaccine in low-income countries was 1% versus 32% in high-income countries overall but 95% in low-income countries versus 34% in high-income countries for target populations. That is, when low-income countries prioritize how best to apply scarce resources, they can often do this more equitably than high-income countries, where allocating limited resources for maximum public good is often challenging. Indeed, one of the global exemplars of equitable access to HPV vaccine is surely Rwanda under Professor Binaguaho's leadership. And we likely have much to learn from their successes even in the United States. I also want to return to the science of treating cancer patients from the clearly biased perspective of a medical oncologist whose academic life has been spent in Sub-Saharan Africa. Worldwide, the portfolio of cancer clinical trials may not be an ideal match either for disease burden or available scientific opportunities. For example, in this recent analysis of randomized clinical trials in oncology between 2014 and 2017, many of the commonest cancers worldwide that are particularly common in LMICs were not among the most frequently studied cancers in RCTs like cancers of the liver and cervix. But while clinical trials in LMICs constituted only 8% of all oncology RCTs, as shown at right, oncology randomized clinical trials in LMICs were more likely to meet their primary endpoints with statistical significance. However, even though oncology randomized clinical trials in LMICs appeared to address common cancers worldwide and were more likely to be scientifically informative, these were not well represented in the highest impact journals, which are dominated by oncology randomized clinical trials from high income countries. That analysis of oncology RCTs actually found no randomized clinical trials from low income countries during the period studied. Aware of this deficit, while in Malawi, we sought to undertake a simple non-randomized phase two clinical trial of rituximab plus CHOP for diffuse large B cell lymphoma in a population with adverse disease characteristics 
and high HIV prevalence. Although rituximab was approved in the US in 1997, we were concerned that there were no prospective demonstrations of safety and efficacy in a population comparable to ours. In data to be published shortly, we found that this was feasible, safe, and effective, even in our setting with all of the challenges I alluded to at the beginning of my talk, resulting in patient outcomes which did not equal but approached those of comparable patient populations in the US. Moreover, in data again to be published shortly, we found CHOP and even RCHOP likely have cost effectiveness in Malawi that is comparable to many other widely accepted public health interventions for which there has been broad-based international multi-sector investment like antiretroviral therapy for HIV. And although these demonstrations have often felt like major successes to our Malawi team, it's sometimes been difficult to interest oncology colleagues in clinical trials involving cancer medicines from the 1990s conducted halfway around the world, even when little comparable data exists for similar populations. In such times, to avoid getting discouraged, I've often gone back to the early HIV equity literature for consolation. For example, this paper describing early HIV treatment efforts in Haiti by Dr. Mukherjee and colleagues, which eloquently captures the philosophical underpinnings of some of our own cancer-related work in Malawi. In this seminal Lancet 2001 paper published when I was still a medical student, they argue that HIV prevention alone is insufficient and expose the unmentioned elephant in the conference rooms of many scientific meetings which is the obligation to provide treatment to some of the world's most vulnerable patients. They go on to highlight individual patient stories of transformation as highly relevant data, in some ways similar to what I told you about Emily and my Malawian BALL patient at the beginning of this talk. They cite the two primary objections raised in 2001 to treating poor communities as being the high cost of medications and the lack of infrastructure. They argue that policy debates which reserve treatment for wealthy countries and prevention for poor countries are misguided. And they conclude by acknowledging that their early treatment efforts in Haiti represent a humble pilot that might not warrant mention in the international medical literature if widespread paralysis had not led to near universal absence of treatment projects in comparable settings. But repeated claims of unfeasibility must be proven untrue. As an oncologist who has tried to embrace similar principles in my own clinical and scientific work, reading this paper, which arguably launched the HIV treatment movement, is both deeply inspiring and deja vu all over again. With that, and in anticipation of our panel discussion, I'll pose just a few questions to conclude. First, are we more willing to make tools of infection control available to LMICs than tools of cancer control? And if so, why? Second, is the subject subjective bar for what constitutes important cancer research unfairly high in LMICs compared with high income countries? Third, are we more interested in performing outrage at global cancer inequity than substantively addressing it? For this third question, parenthetically, I must say I've always felt somewhat embarrassed by how much more attention my idle rants generate in cancer journals than the actual work I've done with colleagues to produce science focused on some of the most vulnerable cancer patients in the world. And finally, how do we address the complex structural factors that cause individuals with certain characteristics, uh, and I've listed several here, to experience greater health inequity, no matter the disease nor the country in which they live? Before closing, I also want to briefly mention that 2021 represents the 50th anniversary of the National Cancer Act in the United States and the 10th anniversary of the creation of the Center for Global Health at the National Cancer Institute. We believe these milestones represent opportunities to commemorate tremendous progress made in cancer research 
and to affirm our commitment to continuing to improve people's lives worldwide. Certainly, I would invite all of you to join us in this reflection and to also join us in this renewal of purpose moving forward. Thank you again for this opportunity. I really look forward to our panel discussion. I just wanted to take a minute and thank all of you for the fantastic, thought-provoking, and really um, amazing presentations. I think um, we all can um, have a lot to think about and, and also think of measures we can take proactively. So thank you very much for the wonderful presentations. Um, we have a couple of questions from the audience. I know um, some of the questions were already addressed, but there's one for Dr. Adams um, about how do you make funders agree to this um, reciprocity and, and the concept around partnership, equal in partnership? Thank you, uh, Vidya. And, and thank you too, to all my co-panelists. What fantastic presentations. And I, I certainly learned a lot and was inspired. Um, so again, this paradigm shift has to happen at every level, right? It has to happen with those of us who engage, engage in this work and, and those of us who are funding this work. I, I think it has to, you have to be able to make your case for this. And I think, um, again, if the sort of human rights equity argument isn't enough, you can always tie it to the success of your programs because I really do feel like <clears throat> it's critical um, that we cannot have, we cannot be successful in this work unless we have equity in, in our work and in our partnerships. So I would try to, uh, you know, push it from the equity agenda, but also uh, push it from the, this is what's needed for us to be successful in this work. I will say in my role as a director of the center, for um, health equity at Dartmouth, raising funds for um, sending uh, our students overseas is on the scale, on the whole relatively easy, right? That's what you know, alumni, philanthropists. That's what they want to fund. It's been so much harder to fundraise for the other direction in the other direction, and I spend a lot of time. Probably, you know, it's probably a ratio of three or four to one um, in terms of time that I spend. Uh, working in the other direction, but people are getting it. And people who, funders who understand um, and know about how we need to practice global health, I think they get it, I think it's catching on. So we have to sort of seize that moment and continue to, and continue to push for it and, and demand it. Thanks, Lisa, that was really helpful. Um, I hope uh, that I addressed your question, Jennifer. Uh, the next question is for Jaya. It's about how can we, the public health research community highlight the importance and need for reparations to target the underlying causes of wealth gap? I know you had talked about reparations. Yeah. Uh, so this is a, a yeah. So that's a great question, um, and I think you know there there is an increasing space in that, and it has to be also obviously for colonized people as well. I mean, most of my work is global. I, my remarks today were about the US uh, work, but the same is true um, everywhere. And I think as Dr. Binaguaho pointed out, the extraction of, of wealth, either by brain drain, by um, untaxed natural resources, um, et cetera, from Africa, Asia, et cetera, is, is profound, but similarly, from communities of color in the United States. So I think there are there is a whole area of scholarship that we can do with communities to look at the connections between the historical trauma, the present day policies, and what is the material cost uh, to lives. And you know, was so thrilled to see uh, Dr. Mary Bassett's recent um, work published in the New England Journal looking at reparations. Um, there are bills in the US. There are some countries that have really been talking about that. Certainly Haiti has since the late 90s. So um, I think there it we should not look at health in a vacuum without addressing the historical uh, aspects. And I think we can put we can put numbers to that. I mean think about the donors that have for many years held us accountable for cost effectiveness research, um, constraining countries to two or three dollars a day for health. Uh, why can't we flip that script and say, you know, 
this intervention is what's needed, whether it's cancer care, HIV, et cetera, and this is what it costs. And by the way, this is the wealth being extracted from this country and have it be as seamlessly integrated into our work as the sort of negative and cost effectiveness strategies have been. Thanks, Jaya. Um, this is the next question is kind of a, 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 an open question to all of the panelists. So I'll start with the first speaker and we can move down the lane. Um, about what are the aspirational goals for global health equity? Um, you know, I, I, we need to have the, uh, uh, our uh, vision in the sky and I wanted to know what would be the ultimate vision and, and then how can we move towards that? Um, so I know this is a loaded question, but I wanted, Lisa, if you can start us off and then we can go down the panel. Sure, um, happy to uh, start with a response. So I think when I sort of, Try to look forward and look into the future, the um, my idyllic uh, future. It would be that global health work is just a level playing field. There's equal opportunity for leadership of different, um, you know, consortia of different projects, and there is not that global north south divide. Uh, let's face it, right? We heard in, in today's panel, and we all know about disparities and challenges in the high income countries, right? We, they, we are certainly by no means devoid of, of um, health inequities and disparities. And so why can't we have, you know, our colleagues from Rwanda or Tanzania leading a, a project that would help us address some of the issues that we're facing in the US? So that is sort of where it's just a, sort of a, a a level playing field, a, a balanced mix of, of um, projects and, and collaborators. And that, that's sort of my, my just very broad vision. So I'll get us started just with that, that um, image. Thanks, um, Lisa, Joya. Oh, um, yeah, I'm second. Uh, I would just um, point to also addressing um, health disparities. I mean, I think that when I started 25 years ago, um, being a global health practitioner, there was no care at all in many places. Uh, we were told it was not possible to do more than vaccination or vitamin A. So we have to work together to make sure that the entirety of the burden of disease is addressed and it's not considered too hard in this or that population. Um, so I think, you know, leading with care and leading with the people who need care, um, I, I want leadership to be um, equitable as well. But I also think, you know, you can have very equitable leadership at the top and, you know, people are dying of a broken leg. And so I, I really feel that we have to insist on equity in the care that's um, delivered. And there's no way to do that without a massive transfer of, of wealth. So we have to work on that. Um, I noticed that, thanks Jaya. I noticed that Dr. Uh, Binagwa has joined us. Um, Dr. Binagwa, the question was the aspirational goals, goals for global health equity and um, how do we achieve that and what are the barriers to achieving that? So I think that if we want to go for global health equity, we need to focus first on equity. Mm -hmm. uh, and this should be our, the, the, <laughs> the flag that, that put all of us together. That means regardless what, and also put away all those measurements of cost effectiveness mm -hmm. that are the more insane against human rights ever. You know, cost effectiveness uh, to, to treat somebody with an handicap is not cost effective. So that means the people who need the most um, health and support are not the one we should treat, uh, according all those uh, references. So regardless your gender, your age, your socioeconomic status, your country of origin, uh, uh, health is a human right, is a commodity for nobody. And redistribution of uh, wealth, like uh, uh, Joya says, of course, because, you know, when I say redistribution of wealth, just live in the developing world, the wealth they have, and they will take care about, uh, uh, we, we can redistribute that. 
but there is a need of redistribution of wealth because uh, health is a human right. And when we talk about decolonizing, the, the, the proper of colonization is go and pick somewhere else something that doesn't belong to you. Mm -hmm. It's still ongoing. And when we say decolonizing global health and health, we should reflect and think what is taken out of this population that belong to that population so much. Mm -hmm. Thanks, um, Dr. Benavar, that was fantastic. And I think that um, you know, connects the, the conversations we've had so far about how do we um, have decolonized the, the knowledge gained itself, you know, how, how, how do we empower our, um, you know, the knowledge so that the, the, everybody gets benefited and it's not just for the select few. So I just wanted to um, connect You know what I, I want to tell you also about knowledge. Uh, uh, the world told me that because I'm black from a black country in Africa, I know maybe a third of what somebody from a fancy Western university knows, and it's so wrong. COVID showed us that that was so wrong. My, my, I'm scared because when COVID will be over, we'll go back to the same uh, judgment. So we should take the drama of COVID to try mm -hmm. to put the notion of knowledge, skills, know-how, right? Thanks um, again. And I uh, same question to uh, Dr. Mauricio Maza. Thanks, uh, Mauricio. If you can talk about the, in the context of COVID, how was it to provide healthcare, especially to this very marginalized population? I, I think that was a real life example and we'd appreciate your thoughts here. I mean, I think it's, it's you know, in COVID and where there's so many limitations in a lot of countries, it, it, for us, you know, and we just thought, how are we gonna continue doing our research? We never thought that it would actually be the way to provide care. And I think, and I think um, getting the support, international support to make this happen is essential. Um, I think to, to address a lot of the problems and it's been historical, uh, limited resource settings need support from outside. And, and, and I think that um, it's not that we don't have the resources or the capability to do it, but um, as far as human resources, I mean, right? But we do need support from outside. I think it's, it's very few countries that, that have developed enough on their research and, 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 and a lot of the implementation methods that, that actually don't need support. So, so in our in our case, we've learned a lot through NCI grants that that have come through, and and that we worked on, and I and I believe there's a lot of projects that actually look outside of the U.S. and and help develop that within our countries, and and that's a great opportunity that that I think could be done in in, in different places, and and I agree, it, it, this should be a win-win situation for everyone. You know, uh, there's both sides learn from different experiences. And now that COVID is, has hit, hit us so hard, we need to really disseminate faster the knowledge and, and the know-how and, and how we can improve uh, based on experiences all over the world. So, so um, I think that we will be able to reach those in need if we learn from each other. Thanks, Mauricio. Um, Monica, uh, your thoughts on, on your aspirational goals for global health equity and um, how what are the barriers around that? Thank you, uh, Vidya. And that, let me just also thank everyone for participating in this really phenomenal session. I have thoroughly enjoyed the talks also and learned a lot. Um, and much of what um, my perspective is has actually been shared by this um, by the, the responses thus far, I mean, I think the only things I would add in terms of global health equity is that we really must do the work with regard to addressing infrahumanization, um, and that is recognizing the humanity in all individuals and in all groups, irrespective of the country that they reside in, and that we make sure that we are fair and just in our practices. I mean, we know we have robust evidence um, in the United States will be my example that racial and ethnic minorities, irrespective of their socioeconomic status, um, often receive less aggressive medical treatments, are more likely to be denied pain medication for fractured bones, 
um, are less likely to be offered opportunities to join clinical trials. And we know about the historic abuses that have been suffered at the hands of biomedical scientists. And I think, you know, other, other issues, of course, are that the minoritized communities are just more likely to be seen in lower healthcare settings. I mean, you can think about infant mortality. Um, and in certain cities in the United States, the infant mortality disparity by race is worse, um, if, for example, in the Cleveland, Ohio area, compared to many um, lower and middle income countries. So these are, you know, experiences that and, and situations that we have to address in a real meaningful way. I think it's important that researchers, that we really diversify the pool of researchers to bring in new and innovative thoughts about how to address these these problems, many of which, you know, I think we, we just, we haven't studied the, the real root of the issue. And that's a big reason why, in my perspective, from my perspective, we haven't moved the needle in health disparities, advanced, you know, sort of closing those gaps or addressing health equity in a real way. Equity work, as we all know, is very difficult if you're doing it, if you're doing it right. Um, and I fully agree that COVID-19, I see it as having um, been the most unfortunate public health crisis of our time but it has provided this much needed window of opportunity. And I think if we capitalize on this in a, in a robust way that we have an opportunity to see positive change. Thanks. Thanks, Monica. Um, Satish, I wanted to connect the same question to you, but I wanted you to think, uh, talk a little bit in the context of the, uh, one of the slides you had presented on um, breast cancer in the African population where the darker skinned individuals still have um, lesser access to care and 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 have lesser um, you know care uh, out better, lesser outcomes for the disease. So I just wanted you to connect that and talk about um, global health equity and how how we can move forward. Sure. I mean, so I think related to that example specifically, uh, you know, I, uh, this gets to I think Monica's slide about the you know the generations of health disparities research. I think we're still you know, that some of this description of um, different patterns and outcomes across, you know, self-reported racial and ethnic categories within Sub-Saharan Africa is still probably first generation uh, disparities <laughs> research. And so, you know, trying to accelerate progress towards some of the same things that we're thinking about domestically in terms of how do we, um, you know, move to a more intervention oriented uh, agenda for that space, I think is important um, in, in global settings as well. Thanks, Satish. Um, the next question I wanted to start with Dr. Binaguaho is you had talked about, at least the, uh, with, a, with a really good example from Rwanda on how you were able to um, kind of de develop a model for you know, engaging and keeping the context of, of an interest of Rwanda. And I was wondering if there are some lessons learned and examples for you to showcase <laughs> for the audience in terms of what we can take um, and, and, and how this can be adapted to other LMIC settings where they, uh, they do need to work collaboratively with uh, partners from the high income countries, but then bringing it to the context of how that would be adaptable to their local needs. You, you, uh, it is about the Human Resource for Health program? Yes. So uh, the Human Resource for Health program was uh, really um, a benediction. Uh, just because for the first time, uh, no, normally USAID, let's say, give $100 million to Rwanda, 60% of it remain in the US or uh, another 20, 25% go to NGOs in the US, come to Rwanda maximum 20% and they still have to run the car, uh, etc. So what have go to the people is very little. The really, the people need, need help. And then we, we negotiate with uh, the, the American administration to manage HIV ourselves as Rwandan, because we have learned how to do that, but keep the money to educate educators in Rwanda, that means faculty, educating research, build the National University of Rwanda, uh, using that money, but bringing from the US 100 faculty member, 50% for nurses, 50% for uh, medical education, and among them 50% for academic uh, ex-cathedra uh, ex uh, education, and the others hands-on. 
So it was absolutely, I'm not going to the detail of this negotiation. It was uh, extraordinary. We had a great support uh, in Washington to do that. It, uh, we will never have done it alone. And um, it worked. And for example, of the result of that now, so we had those uh, 23 um, uh, Institute of Higher Education from the US uh, coming to Rwanda for a long period. Stop those two weeks, three weeks, three days. If they are coming really to teach and in depth and helping create curricula, etc. And now the University of Rwanda is capable to educate. Uh, before it was less than 100 doctors a, a year. Now it is 300. And this also has helped create eight residency and um, and many advantages that go to that there is still a long way to go but if we didn't have that and still continue to do business as usual we will still be at the place where uh, our um, faculty are, doesn't have uh, the, the training the adequate training to really run an university correctly now it's really um, uh, Rwandan led and of better quality. So the lesson learned from that, if you want to develop a country, develop the country. Don't make sure that the money you give to the country develop Washington, Paris, or London, and uh, allow the overhead to be used by the country mm -hmm. to develop themselves and structural development, not surface development. Develop for sustainability and uh, really the people you pretend to help. Can I just add in quickly um, that, Please. you know, one of the, to the question of what can we do in terms of reparations, restitution, um, you know, billions of dollars are spent in trainings, and we all know what those trainings are. You know, people are pulled away from the front lines of care. They sit in a five-star hotel and drink tea. They get a PowerPoint, and they, go, and they learn nothing, and they have no mentoring, and it, it perpetuates this broken system. And what Dr. Benaguaho did was say, fine, just give us that money, but allow us to use it for long-term training instead of this TOT. I mean, that kind the, the money, it wasn't new money. It wasn't mm -hmm. new money. It was just spent money in a way that was going to build the system. And so that's the kind of, and where does that come from? I mean, in my analysis, where that comes from is the 1961 Foreign Assistance Act, which was writ written during the Cold War, when Africa was really, and Latin America, Asia were, you know, uh, a play, playground for the Cold War. And it was a buy American force open markets. Uh, you know, that's what our aid is about. So we've got to change that. Um, and so I think it's also trying to understand what money is going for and why. Why do we have this bizarre per diem economy? Well, that actually comes from the United States. It comes from the Cold War. And we need to then deconstruct and dismantle that structure. Thanks, um, Joya. That was really helpful to, you know, extend what uh, the points made by uh, Dr. Binagwa. I wanted to ask a, a similar question to Mauricio because you have you uh, you are working in the LMIC setting, and we wanted to know what your thoughts were in terms of using funds, um, say from NIH and other U.S. agencies in delivering care, and then what are some of the challenges to find the balance between what works what's important to the local context and how you make that happen. Yeah, I mean, I think that the, the, the funding that and, and the mechanisms of grants that we've used like the UH2 and UH3 um, and uh, are specifically uh, targeted to, to that the outcome is gonna help limited uh, income settings, right? So when we see this sort of, and, and like I said before, I think this should be a win-win for both sides. Um, some technologies will pro probably will be just used in LMICs and some, some outcomes of this might be ab able to be used in the US eventually. Um, but I think uh, there's always uh, 
we have to think positively when 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 we have these interactions. I I don't think I've ever been in a situation um, where we feel like we have to do something because this is the sort of the funding that's coming to you. But we've also been very transparent about it since the beginning, right? I don't think we would we would do something based on somebody else's need. It it, it has to be sort of a win win. And I think uh, as part of, of, of those different interactions with different organizations, we are just improving, you know, how we actually conduct research. Um, and, 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 and that's what, there's, there's a lot to gain from that uh, because in some situations, uh, there's a lot of, um, uh, you can learn about uh, and, and as much as you can learn through reading, and do, but until you actually do it, you really understand all the difficulties of research. And in a lot of our settings, there's not enough of that happening. So having people that do have that experience supporting countries that, that are starting to do this, right? Keep, you know, not everyone is gonna be used to do a randomized control trial, right? And, you know, people that have that experience, how can they show us how to do that? Because eventually, Yes, that's what we all want to do. We, we all want to have our own infrastructure to then be able to say, in order for us to make a specific study that's going to help our population locally, you know, this is the best thing that we could do. Now, that may take a very long time, but, um, but it's something that has to start somehow. And, and, and I do believe that having support from, from outside and from organizations that have so many knowledge uh, it has been extremely helpful. And again, it's just not only for us, but for other countries that have been involved in multi-center studies. So um, I, I, I see a lot uh, of great things that can happen from this sort of collaborations. Thanks, Mauricio. Um, Satish, just to uh, not uh, uh, dwell too much on this point, but I wanted to get your quick thoughts on how your experience in the, you know, working in Malawi you, you know, working for UNC in Malawi, how do, how has that integrated into providing care for the local setting, and also keeping in mind that your um you know your uh, your priorities are your your affiliations were for the United States. Just wanted to for you to contrast on that. Um. Yeah, you know, I think we were just um really focused on trying to um address the need, you know, we were integrated and we were really, I, I think everything we did really arose, I think, from this desire to kind of address the specific needs of patients and communities. And so I like, I don't consider myself a social scientist or an implementation scientist, but when you're, you know, when you're trying to provide cancer treatment to individuals who traveled halfway across the country, inevitably you have to try to address some of these, you know, issues. Um, and, and again, I think that I think because so you know our scientific energy was really um, centered, you know we tried really tried to center it within Malawi. I think similar to what others have said on this call. I think that you know then you mold and evolve your program, you know perhaps in way you know in year one and year in year two and three in a way that maybe you weren't exactly planning when you set it up because you just you know you have a better contextual understanding for what is going to be needed to make the program successful and you know really deliver something of value to the patients and communities that you're serving so i think that embeddedness learning from experience that, that real contextual which again I, I admit i'm an oncologist you know i'm like a clinical translational investigator so i you know but it's you just can't help but engage in some of these broader issues if you're, you know, even to do, you know, admittedly some fairly narrow work in a specific disease area that you're trying to do, so. Thank you, Satish. Uh, Monica, uh, can I hand you the mic for the next question? You want to take the lead? Sure. Sure, happy to. So we'd like to talk a bit about uh, the role of research and also research capacity building in addressing health disparities, promoting health equity, so we'd like to hear the panelists talk a little bit about solutions and your thoughts on actionable steps that can address many of the challenges that have been raised. For instance, the power imbalances in global health research. Um, so if you have any thoughts there, we'd be delighted to hear them. Who'd like to start? I 
I'm happy to take a leap Please. first. So again, as I keep on thinking about how we structure our um, collaborations, but also how we measure their success as being so critical to this. So um, for example, I really think, again, some of it rests with the funders to think about um, how you are going to, uh, how funders will support truly collaborative work, uh, work that truly is serving the, the communities that they're allegedly or intended to, to serve. You know, I think having more safeguards to make sure that that is actually happening. And then, you know, we've talked about other sort of, which seemed to me like some low hanging fruit, like this should, should, should be so obvious that of course, any research that's gonna get published is gonna get published in open access journals. That should just be, you know, a given. Um, one of the things that we've started to do in our collaborations is not just measure the success by how many publications there are, but how many publications have either a first author or a senior author that is, you know, from the, the um, low income country. Again, to try to say that this is not just about high income country, you know, PhD students, postdocs, junior or even senior faculty sort of um, producing publications for their own CVs, but it, it is really about um, supporting and nurturing. And I, I think too, when Choyo is so, speaking so um, importantly about the kind of training that has to happen, I think, and I know this from my own experience, certainly, that so much of the training that I think is really successful is when it's that, you know, close mentoring that happens. Mm -hmm. And I feel like if you are going to support someone to be a first author or someone is a even you know who um, has has uh, is relegated as a senior author, it, with that first author, it's a lot about that one-on-one -on -one mentoring, mm -hmm. and I feel like that's where so much of the learning takes place. That's certainly <clears throat> been my experience and the experience experience of many of my colleagues. And so again, I just think sort of flipping some of the metrics that we use to evaluate the mm -hmm. success of our research collaborations, of our research mm -hmm. outcomes and outputs, um, and really trying to shift to um, a, a more uh, focused, individualized, tailored uh, mentoring and support of, of researchers, again, wherever it is we're working. Thank you, Lisa. I appreciate that uh, response very much. Um, the mentorship piece, uh, we all can agree, is critical to um, you know, that's where we have the next generation, the next cadre of scientists who are going to carry this forward with the freshest ideas. Um, and that, that mentoring is critical. Um, other thoughts about research capacity building is, and uh, shifting the power balances. I can go next for a few Please. ideas. Uh, first of all, it's not normal that 12% of the population do only 1% of the research. That's the case of Africa. So there is something totally already, uh, uh, totally abnormal uh, there. But also uh, research should be uh, not measured on if you publish in a journal that is fancy and it's read among fancy people as well, not about the people we are talking about. How many lives did we save? How many policy did we change? Because this is the true meaning of a research is to improve the life of people. And the way we measure the outcome of a research and publication is how many people that are looking like you read you. So it's, it's totally, um, we should stop and fight against that and really award the research that has, that has uh, fulfill the mission of improving life of uh, people. Thank and you. Also, you know, all those, on that all those journal are another business that we are all contributing to, on the yeah. back again of the people who die. Yeah. Yeah. You're I right. Guess I mean, I, we, oh, we, go ahead. Sorry. No, I'm just going to simply. I would love to hear what you have to say, but just to say that. You know, I can um, appreciate those sentiments very much, and that's a, we always have to keep in mind 
that there are people behind the research, behind the numbers, behind the data, and that's the reason that we should be doing this. It's not simply about advancing one's career, or how mm -hmm. many publications you have in the highest impact journal. Um, certainly, um, if you haven't helped anyone, then you know you have to be be thinking about about that. Please, Joya. No, just that I I think uh, the reason I'm a bit quiet on this particular question is. I actually, several years ago, really stepped back from doing research with a capital R because I didn't feel that I could take credit for work um, that other people were doing day to day. And when I say other people, I mean community health workers, I mean the kitchen staff, and it just gave me, um, you know, a fair amount of uh, a feeling of sort of guilt that even in writing research, who are we sort of focusing on and what say do they really have in the work? And yet that has mean, meant, you know, I didn't get promoted at Harvard. So I think there's lots of, you know, complexities. There are people who are more aggressive seeking out their career path and they do better in our American framework. Um, and so that is a real challenge. That is a real challenge. And what's uh, Joya is terrible because all the friends I have who have done great by developing the capacity in, the de in this part of the world are those who are not promoted in Harvard because they spend too much time with us. Yeah. And in the end, they have saved so many more lives. They have done so many mm -hmm. mindful research to do how to use already the existing things and also to promote new uh, innovation uh, in hands. But it's just to tell you that the, 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 acad the, the global academia family mm -hmm. is really a golf club. It is, it's a golf club and it's really still, you know, measuring impact by what journals you publish in rather than by how many people so, you've trained and helped and how many lives you've been able to save and you know um i think how to reflect that you know through the nih how to re you know i mean i i think research should be done it's not that i'm anti-research but i think it's it's a we have created a system that values metrics that do not take into account racism and injustice um and i think that's a big problem. Thanks, Joy and um, Dr. Vinay Guaho. Th th those are very thoughtful comments. We have one question for um, Dr. Vinay Guaho and um, uh, Dr. Mazza from um, from the audience. Can you discuss the impact of administrative hurdles that international funders have in place of applying for and managing grants? Um, and uh, to what degree is the need for building these administrative capacities, diverting efforts from for more critical needs? So what are some strategies you engage in for mitigating these impacts of HIC, HIC researchers, um, researcher funder bureaucracy? Um, again, it, it connects really well with what all the um, issues we've dealt so far, but um, uh, I'll, I'll let Mauricio uh, begin first. Um, your thoughts, Mauricio? Oh, sorry, I was muted. So, um, yeah, I, I think that's a great question. There, uh, there's uh, a lot of complexity around what needs to be re required from an admin point of view in a lot of these grants. And and I will, uh, I, I recall a, a, a great colleague of us, uh, Sil Silvina Rossi, and she received an R01 for cervical cancer implementation research. And I think more than the actual research, the concern at the time is like, how am I going to do all this administrative work? Um, you know, uh, as a small organization, that's something that we are constantly trying to figure out. How do we get to that place? Because, you know, we're subcontracted through different universities that, that um, in order to, 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 to do a lot of this grant, uh, we're, not the, we're not the primes in, in, in a lot of this. So, um, and there's a lot of challenges that come with it. So I think even as, I think, look, thinking forward in, in, in the context of global health research and working with 
you know, smaller institutions or that don't have as much personnel to tackle on a lot of that. Uh, maybe there could be uh, courses, uh, you know, for admin people in these organizations that can actually make you look at this with less fear than we do. And at the same time, sometimes just think like, you know, we just can't do it, right? We, we, we can't manage a grant of, of that site because probably what's required from, from, from their side is something that we, we just can't take on, even though we could do everything as far as the logistics of the research and stuff, but at the, from, the, from uh, all that back office that might happen is, are, are things that probably would scare more than one person. And, and, we, and we've seen that before. And, and, and I think it's, it, it's a big challenge, but I think it's, it's, it's an area that definitely, uh, it would be very helpful if there could be ways to work around that. Thanks, Mauricio. Um, Dr. Binaguaho, um, we have last few minutes, but I'd like to get your thoughts for this question as well. So first of all, there is no more colonial uh, adventure than uh, apply for a grant in uh, that your part of the world. That's really going for a colonial journey. First of all, uh, they complicate the rules, not because it's needed for the research or for the science, or just because they have colonialist bias. We are stealing the money. We don't know how to manage. Okay, we can manage a country, but not a little research. So secondly, the, the cost of doing research, the time of the people in the North is paying more than three times the time of somebody in my place of the world. Oh, what do you mean? This is slavery. And mm -hmm. if Black life matter, the brain of black people matter as well. <laughs> and I'm fighting for black brain matter. So um, colonialism from A to Z complicated things just to make it impossible. And just because they don't trust. And they don't trust because they have colonialist bias. Time is money for everybody. And if the time of somebody in your part of the world value more than my time, that mean you slave me Simply, you continue. We need to change all this. Mm -hmm. Thank you. With those powerful words, we are almost at the end of the time. So I wanted to just give a recap on the amazing, you know, points brought out by this panel. Um, we, you know, we ha we heard about reciprocity in partnership, about understanding the context, and Mauricio gave us a fantastic real life example of how that's done. We uh, definitely learned about the shared value of knowledge and um, the shared mastery of le learning together as opposed to learning um, one of us teaching the other. We definitely thought of improving lives and uh, you know, keeping that vision in mind as opposed to just getting our research and our career goals accomplished. And, and then Dr. Binaguaho has made a fantastic case for holding funders responsible and I think um, as a funding agency, we will also be uh, rethinking some of these strategies within how we put out our funding announcements. So with that, I wanted to take a big, um, give a big thank you to all the panelists for your time, for your flexibility and for your advice and, and, and all your amazing thoughtfulness here. So thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>